Good afternoon. My name is uh, Jim Smith. I'm from Princeton University, and I'm uh, chair of the committee that's uh, examining methods for modernizing probable maximum uh, precipitation. I'd like to welcome uh, attendees, speakers, and committee members uh, to this uh, information session. Uh, in beginning, I'd like to give a special thanks to the National Academies uh, Committee for the excellent job that they've done in organizing this session. Uh, Jonathan, Stephen, Katrina, and Kyle, uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, to begin, I'd like to uh, quickly uh, go through and have each of the committee members uh, give uh, just their name and affiliation, and I'll just go through uh, what I see on uh, on my screen. So John N. G. Uh, is first on my screen. Wow. Okay. John Nielsen Gammon. I'm in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at Texas A&M University. And Effie, I see you next. Uh, hi, this is Effie Fufula Giorgio. I'm in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of California, Irvine. And Dan Cooley. I'm Dan Cooley. I'm in the Department of Statistics at Colorado State University. Uh, Katie. Hello, my name is Katie Holman. I work um, in the Technical Service Center for the Bureau of Reclamation. And John E. Hi, John England. I'm a lead civil engineer at the Army Corps of Engineers uh, Risk Management Center. Uh, Ruby. Hi, I'm Ruby Long from Atmospheric Sciences and Global Change Division, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, Chris. I'm Chris Pachark. I'm a statistician in the Department of Statistics at the University of California, Berkeley. And um, Russ. Russ Schumacher, uh, Department of Atmospheric Science at Colorado State University. Uh, Xi Chi. Hi, I'm Xi Chie Kao. I'm from Environmental Sciences Division of Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, let's see, did I miss anybody? Robert, excuse me, Robert oh, Mason. Oh, yes, Robert. Robert Mason, formerly U.S. Geological Survey, retired. Thanks, Robert. Um, uh, so if we could move forward to the statement of tasks, uh, just to give an idea to um, the attendees uh, of um, um, what the committee is really focusing on. I'll, I'll go to the very end. Uh, ultimately, the committee is tasked with recommending approaches for probable maximum precipitation estimation uh, that um, incorporate the effects of climate change uh, and uh, provide for characterization uh, of uncertainty. So that's kind of the bottom line of what the committee is tasked to do. One of the key elements and one of the key tasks in um, and uh, achieving um, the goals of that task uh, uh, deals with uh, advances uh, in data used for probable maximum precipitation um, studies. And that will be the focus um, of, the, um, of the information workshop uh, today. Um, and uh, can we move to the next slide? Um, there, uh, there are a collection of questions that form the initial set uh, of data issues that the committee is wrestling with. Uh, roughly, they're looking at um, data for uh, uh, probable maximum precipitation in the pre-radar era in the US and the radar era in the US. Uh, and then a third set of questions that uh, we're uh, working with uh, are how to use reanalysis fields uh, and downscaling simulations uh, based on reanalysis uh, fields for probable maximum precipitation. Uh, so they'll be uh, among the principal themes that we will uh, deal with uh, in this information workshop. Uh, data and data issues are much broader than that. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we would like to get um, uh, uh, from the attendees and from the discussions today are broader ideas of what uh, the community sees as the most important issues, uh, data issues uh, that are associated with making uh, major advances in, um, in probable maximum precipitation. So there's the catch-all 
um, uh, at the end. Um, now, uh, one of the main ways that we're going to be dealing with this today is through presentations and questions for a group of speakers. And if we could move to the uh, agenda, um, what we um, uh, have organized are, are presentations from six speakers. Um, the presentations will be about 15 minutes in length, and I'll give a, a two minute uh, note at about 13 minutes into the presentations, and then 10 minutes uh, for questions. Um, the questions um, will uh, initially come from uh, members of the, uh, of the committee, and they'll sort of target things that uh, the commit, commi committee members see as most important uh, for resolving. Um, uh, you'll also be, the attendees will also be able to post questions and as time permits, uh, we'll deal with them today. But um, if we're unable to deal with them today, they will become an important part of the material uh, that the committee will be using um, uh, further in their deliberations. Uh, so we'll have a short break after the uh, first three presentations uh, and, um, and then uh, have the final three. Um, and so there are, there are a variety of ways that um, we're looking to get input. And if we could move to the next uh, slide then, um, one way is to provide, um, uh, for attendees to provide questions um, uh, through Slido. Uh, and you can do this um, uh, through the uh, Slido link below the live stream. Uh, you can scan the QR code or you can go to the web page. Um, and so the questions are one way of uh, contributing to the process, uh, but more broadly, we'll be looking uh, to get um, uh, feedback um, uh, on issues that are raised today uh, that the community thinks are, uh, that are important uh, to uh, pursue. So if we can move to the next um, uh, slide. Um, after the presentation, uh, provide comments, feedback, issues uh, that you think the committee should uh, be considering uh, and addressing all of the tasks. We're specifically looking for uh, input um, now uh, for uh, the issues that really uh, pertain to data. Uh, so th that's the, the agenda. We'll work through our, uh, our presentations uh, and questions, but we look for a, um, a, a longer term engagement on these issues uh, from the community. Um, so with that, let's move right into um, our uh, presentations. Uh, the first presentation uh, will be from uh, Ken Kunkel from uh, North Carolina State. Uh, Ken, you have the uh, virtual floor. Okay, so let me share my presentation and see if you all can see it. Yes. Okay, well, I'll jump right in then. So these are the two questions that were addressed to me uh, for presentation here. One regards how can atmospheric water balance variables contribute to modernized methods for computing PMP? And what are the key data sets for assessing trends in PMP magnitude storms? I'll be talking about these in kind of reverse order. And I'm gonna do my last slide first so I don't run out of time and go over my key points. Uh, so regarding trends and looking at trends, first of all, there's a question of historical trends. And I would say that the um, co-op network, uh, which is uh, captured within the global historical climatology network data set, remains the backbone for looking at trends in extreme precipitation. I'm going to show some uh, aerial analysis that I have done that provides some insights into causal mechanisms of very large events. Also regarding historical trends, you know, when the original HMRs were done, uh, we, they had limited tools. We now have lots more tools, and one of those is reanalysis, and that provides some um, important meteorological insights into dynamical and ther thermodynamical features of historic events. Uh, regarding future trends, um, we have uh, large ensembles of global climate model simulations, either many models or multiple simulations from the same model. And I think that forms a key data set suite for looking at future trends. Regarding the water vapor uh, question, uh, precipitable water has been the standard metric 
and uh, it's highly correlated with extreme event magnitudes. But some other metrics that, that appear in the literature, such as integrated vapor transport and moisture convergence, may provide other insights into PMP events. And reanalyses actually make this possible where uh, it wasn't that possible uh, decades ago. So I'm going to hit a few of the research areas that I've been working in that relate to these uh, questions. So first of all, data sets for historical purposes. So what might some of the requirements be for appropriate data sets? Well, I would say they need to be temporally long and homogeneous with good spatial coverage. And the uh, National Weather Service's co-op network does check all, the all of these boxes uh, to some extent. So if we wanna look at analyses to look at trends, uh, what do we need for PMP trend analysis? Well, it's a real challenge. We got PMP, which almost by definition doesn't happen very often. We only approach it uh, rarely. And so that presents a statistical challenge. And so I've been thinking about, well, how might one look at this from a statistical standpoint? And so I'm gonna show some results for a metric that is definitely below PMP levels, but uh, maybe the uh, sample size is big enough we can learn something. And that's the all-time record rainfall at a station. And when, do those, when have those records occurred? And this shows uh, the results of an analysis I did based on uh, 856 stations with more than 100 years of records. So they span uh, mostly the entire 20th century up to present time. And basically what I'm showing here is the, the distribution of the years in which those records occurred across the US. I've done it for two different durations, a one day record and a three day uh, accumulated record. Uh, there's small differences, and I'm showing it pentad by pentad here, small differences between three day and one day. If you look at the trend, they're virtually identical. And what you see is an overall upward trend. And generally we've seen more records, relatively speaking, since 1995 than before that time. And if you look at the uh, period with the most records, the largest percentage of records that occurred in the most recent five year period of 2015 to 2019. Let me show uh, some results for another metric, and that's the largest area averaged events that have occurred in uh, the coterminous US. Uh, this analysis shows results for 50,000 square kilometers and four day duration. And uh, in this analysis, I'm comparing with historical events for the 70 year period of 20, 1949 to 2018. I did this analysis in the wake of um, Harvey and Florence, and that was sort of the motivation for doing this. I took the top 100 events and then looked at where they occurred, what caused them, and how they were distributed in time. So first of all, this shows a ranking of the magnitude of these events. And uh, one message here, hey, Harvey was a pretty bad storm. Uh, in fact, it's the largest event under these criteria of area and duration and the largest by a large amount, it's 50% higher than the second ranked event. Uh, Florence is no slouch uh, in this particular, for this particular metric, it ranks number seven. And if you look at the causes here, the, I've shown the top 30 events and the causes include uh, atmospheric rivers, uh, subtropical lows, fronts, extropical cyclones and tropical cyclones. So where are these located in the US? Probably no surprise, uh, the uh, bulk of them are in the southeast quadrant of the US. There's also another tranche of them along the west coast. Uh, you might think in the Gulf Coast that maybe most of them, maybe all of them or most of them are tropical cyclones and quite a few of them are, but actually the largest um, number of them in terms of uh, meteorological cause are fronts, frontal events. And how are they distributed in time, these 100 events? Well, there are more events in the latter part of this period than the first part. Um, you notice that the highest number of this 125 of them occurred in the last uh, 10 year period that, that I analyzed in this particular study. Okay, are there other data sets that we could use for trend analysis for the historical period? Uh, well, uh, stage four radar immediately comes to mind 
great temporal and spatial resolution, um, ideal for lots of extreme precipitation studies. But for trend analysis, I would say the period of record is just too short. Uh, what about satellite estimates? Uh, they have some real advantages, uh, kind of uniform coverage. But again, the period of record is too short. There are other networks uh, out there. Kokoros is a nice resource for looking at event uh, uh, big events. But again, uh, at most uh, 20 plus years of record for the longest stations. Uh, Ross is an interesting one uh, that I've thought about. Uh, the longest Ross stations do go back into the, the 1980s and even they may extend even back to the 19, late 1970s. So now we're talking about maybe 40 years of data. And while I haven't, I've never done anything with that, it is an interesting one that may, perhaps could be um, mined for more information on trends in the, in the Western US specifically. Now, let me turn to the water balance variable uh, question. Uh, well, what are potential water balance variables? Well, here's four of them, possibly. Dew point temperature, precipitable water, those are the two that have been used. Dew point temperature has always been used uh, as really a surrogate for precipitable water um, when for the early part of the record when we didn't we don't have precipitable water observations. Integrated vapor transport, water vapor convergence, those are other ones that uh, could provide insights. I do want to show some re results of analysis I did using precipitable water. And it really isn't for PMP, but it's for variables that go into uh, NOAA Atlas 14. So we're talking about the annual maximum series, uh, partial duration series. Uh, and uh, what I was looking at is how correlated are the magnitude of these events with uh, precipitable water. So I looked at, had about 3000 stations uh, uh, for each station for each annual maximum value, look, uh, look, used reanalysis to find uh, the precipitable water and the vertical velocity associated for the nearest grid point to that station, and then aggregated it all together. And I come up with a relationship uh, like this, uh, where I have a very- Our analysis found that there is a very good relationship. Sorry about that. Did you hear that? <laughs> Pulled a slide from a, a, a recorded one. Anyway, let me go back here a little bit to this one that here. Um, so there's a strong correlation between um, precipitable water, a monotonic relationship, and the precipitation magnitude of these events. So precipitable water does, uh, at least for these kinds of events, provide a very good metric if you wanted to use it for uh, estimating precipitation magnitude. There's even a stronger relationship with aerial coverage of the big events. So this shows the air uh, distribution of areas on, a, on, on days in which there was at least one event that was an annual maximum value. And there's actually uh, not just a linear relationship, but a nonlinear relationship uh, curving upward, uh, indicating that the uh, aerial coverage of, of large events um, uh, increases very, very quickly with the amount of precipitable water. So what about integrated vapor transfer and water vapor convergence. Those are appearing much more frequently in, in studies of um, extreme precipitation and looking at these relationships. Um, I expect that these very, all these variables would be highly correlated, um, but perhaps integrated vapor transport and water vapor convergence provides more direct link than precipitable water uh, to extreme precipitation amounts. Um, I haven't done that kind of research yet. Um, another issue to address here, what's readily available in reanalyses and climate model simulations? Um, in reanalyses, uh, ERA-5 has integrated vapor transport, for example, but not all of them do. If we look at climate model simulations, those are not standard variables that are provided. For that matter, precipitable water is generally not provided. So in any of these uh, for climate model simulations, one all, uh, has a uh, computational uh, uh, task to do to get at those variables. 
I want to make one remark about reanalysis, and that regards a state case study that I did for the Colorado, New Mexico study that updated PMP values. And the question came up about uh, transposition of a particular event, the 1964 Gibson Dam uh, extreme rainfall event. And the question arose whether this event should be transposed to Colorado. It had been in an HMR study, it had, had it not been in another study. And so there was a question about whether it should be. And I used uh, the NCEP NCAR reanalysis to diagnose vertical motion and moisture transport fields to provide a recommendation on whether it should or shouldn't. Um, and I provide a bunch of slides at the end of this presentation. So the committee wants to look in more detail about um, what I did in that, uh, uh, that that'll be, that's available there. Jim, what about two minutes, uh, two minutes to wrap future up. projections? Uh, precipitable water and big events. I just wanna point out uh, the study that I did a few years ago, where I looked at an analysis of precipitable water change in CMIP5 models and just point out that the models uh, simulate quite large increases in precipitable water in the future and everywhere. Water vapor goes up everywhere across the globe. So very uh, robust relationship. We also did recently analysis of, C of the CMIP archive, looking at very large events over CONUS in, uh, in those models. And without getting into detail, we looked at a historical period and a future period. Uh, this is an analysis showing the uh, magnitude of the top 10 events in the model and the, both uh, historical and future. Uh, most of the models produce a, amounts that are less than observed, but a few models get mod, uh, approximate amounts equal to um, what's been observed. The last bar there is the observations. And finally, the uh, Ratio of uh, future to, uh, uh, to historical, most of the models simulate increases. There's a few uh, exceptions to that, but overall they're simulating roughly a 25% increase in the largest events. And so those are my key points. And just kind of a last uh, uh, thought is that, you know, PMP silence, science is unique and that expert judgment underlies many decisions. And, uh, and I, uh, ponder the questions about what can nature produce? Are there fundamental limits? If so, what are they? Thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk to the committee. Great. Thanks, Ken. Um, let's see. I, um, I'm going to, uh, I believe John Nielsen Gammon has a question right off the bat. Am I right, John? Yeah, sure. Why not? Um, hi, Ken. Hi. Um, the, this is not one of the questions you were meant to address, but I think among the people who are going to be talking, you're probably best qualified to answer it. Um, you know, all the data sets you showed are, are well validated, quality controlled data sets, essentially. Um, but for actual PMP analyses, we we use data that's that's almost anecdotal. It's been through some extensive validation perhaps for some of past events, but there's no longer really a formal process for validating those sorts of extremes that aren't part of a regular network. And NCEI has this very involved process for saying, yes, that's an official record. It seems odd we, you know, do we need something like that for uh, PMP type storms, which are going to be so important for, for regulations? Well, I think, um, I mean, for trend analysis, it's one thing to, if you want to look at trends, you do have to have, uh, I think, um, some fairly, I don't know, guardrails on, on what data you allow in. But for evaluation of individual events, uh, given the caveats, you know, you, you do have to pay attention to and kind of evaluate the um, quality of those observations. But, you know, I think everything should go in, you know, to... Uh, establishing the spatial distribution and the amount of a rainfall event that is approaching PMP levels. So I don't know if that's what the question you were asking, but you know, in uh, my old days working at the Illinois State Water Survey, when there were big events, the scientists would go out and do bucket surveys to establish uh, more detail the, the kind of spatial and temporal morphology of events. And I think those are uh, Kind of the kind of data that 
really shouldn't be lost, I guess, uh, in uh, terms of the full suite of activities that go on around PMP. Was that the question to answer your question, John? Um, I guess, um, let me just follow up briefly. Um, should, you know, should, should there be some agency tasked with saying officially what the storm total was for a given event, for example? Well, that would be ideal, I think. Have, have experts evaluate the, uh, all the observations and uh, provide their judgment of, um, you know, what did this storm produce? I mean, Harvey's a good example of that. Um, and some of the analysis you did and maybe eliminated, eliminating some of the large outliers in that particular event as being probably uh, uh, in error. Okay, thank you. See, uh, Effie, I believe you have a question. And John, John E next. So Ken, you mentioned uh, satellite, uh, possibility of using satellite data, but then you said the record is too short. And my question is, if we were not looking at historical trends, but individual events of the order of PMP, could we be open to looking at events that happened outside Conus? Um, and basically enlarge our knowledge of, you know, the limits of nature? Yeah, I would say, um, uh, you know, if we have obviously in situ observations and radar, I would say those are superior to satellite. That's my own personal yeah. evaluation of, you know, the nature of the data set. But when we're in situations where we don't have those, um, I do think that, that that is a resource that could be tapped to understand on a larger context, uh, what, can the nat what can nature produce? You know, getting back to my final, maybe semi-philosophical questions is what is na nature capable of? And if we have the whole globe to evaluate that, mm -hmm. you know, I think it, it increases our knowledge much as if we wanna look into the future, some of the analysis we're doing what I would like to do further is to examine in large suites of models and large ensemble models, what can nature produce in those kind of, you know, we only have one earth and one history to look at, but the models provide a way perhaps to examine the limits of, of, of what nature can produce. Okay, thank you, Ken. John. Hi, Ken. Thanks for the wonderful presentation. Appreciate your insights and inputs. Question is, um, on that future part, um, there seems to be a lot of opportunity to really go after IVT and convergence. And just off the cuff, can you comment on our elusive charge of maximization? So the question is, do we see observationally any physical limits so far? Yeah, well, my um, answer is a little similar to what I just said <laughs> in that, um, you know, if we let's just take the example of a model with um, um, uh, 10 realizations out 100 years in the future. Now, all of a sudden, we have a thousand years. Maybe we get a few other models that have that. Now, you know, we have to we have these cross model problems, perhaps uh, comparing apples and Different, different flavor, you know, different varieties of apples. But um, I do think that, um, and that's something I've wanted to do for some time, but haven't had the bandwidth to do it, uh, to see what are the true limits of, you know, how, how, um, how large can water vapor get? Can we find situations where um, some of our big PMP vents, let's take Harvey, you know, tropical cyclone that's, that sits in the same place for five, six days. Can we find examples in the models perhaps that duration is longer? Just take an example. And that's sort of a lot of what I'm thinking about are, hey, you know, we get this frontal event, we got tropical cyclones, we got tro tro uh, frontal events, the front stays stationary for four or five days and produces PMP level precipitation or near PMP level precipitation. 
But what prevents that front from staying around for 10 days and additional waves moving across? What are the limits? And perhaps uh, climate model simulations can provide some insights into that. What are the true outliers that we haven't seen historically, but um, perhaps can happen? Yeah, thanks, especially with the, with the clear record you're already showing on precipitation increases and obviously the temperature. That's our big concern is temperature and the moisture. So yeah, yeah. yeah thanks. Let's see, I think uh, we have another question from John and G and then Xi. Xi. Okay, thank you. Um, so Ken, you showed some trends in um, quantities associated with um, record precipitation. And thinking in terms of the, the PDF of extremes, that's not not PDF storms, it's a P, uh, PMP storms, it's a way off from there. How yes, do you propose yeah. we go about translating trends in one level of extreme to trends in another extreme? I don't, I don't have a solution to that um, other than um, is there consistency as we go from, you know, essentially my metric that I was showing there, the, the point is a hundred year storm. Let's say I'm looking at maybe the distribution of a hundred year storm level events. Um, and um is that consistent with 50 year storms? I think we could push that out further, um, you know, maybe um, going out to um, the distribution of, I, I don't know, I'm, I've got some thoughts in my mind about how one could, could go out to maybe three or four or 500 year storms, but, um, but we are limited. I don't have an easy solution to get around that. Are the trends I'm finding in, uh, 100 year storms, um, if we had a long enough time series, you know, stationary time series, would we see the same thing in PMP storms? Can't answer that, I don't think. Okay. Thanks. Okay, let's take one last question from Shi Chi and then we'll have to move on to our next speaker. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, first of all, wonderful presentation. I am especially intrigued by the uh, high correlation you show uh, uh, between the uh, water vapor uh, water vapor versus rainfall depths, because I think that for us, that's one of the biggest challenge to do the PMP calculation. So since you're so familiar with all this data, I basically want to ask for your opinion is uh, how, what, in your view, what will be the best way or best data to calculate the uh, principal water, like using real analysis or conventionally people has been just picking station and calculate dew point and try to use dew point to approximate uh, principal water. So in your view, which, which will be the better way to do that? I certainly think for um, the more modern period, let's say from 1950 onward, reanalysis are, are, I would think, the best tool to use for that. Um, as we go back beyond, you know, essentially before the Radiosan era, um, becomes a little more uh, uncertain, I think, about that. Um, but I, um, um, I think just the, the, you know, the basis for reanalysis, I'd be tempted to still rely on reanalysis for that. Hey, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And thanks very much. And um, with that, we'll move to our uh, second presentation from uh, Alexander Rishkoff, uh, University of Oklahoma and the National Severe Storms Lab. Alexander, the uh, virtual floor is yours again. Okay, thank you, Jim. I hope that you've seen my slide, right? Yes. And my, and my cursor as well. Um, all right, I'm Alexander Rishkov, uh, and I will talk about utilization of polarimetric weather radar data for PMP estimation. And here are uh, uh, these couple of questions uh, for discussions I, I have to address, and both uh, relate to rather rainfall estimates and also uh, errors of rainfall estimation for PMP magnitude storms. I will start from this uh, uh, table uh, uh, illustrating three generation or other rainfall estimates. Uh, first generation, uh, that was uh, uh, 
before the polarimetric upgrade of the next trade in 2013, all uh, rainfall estimates in various catalogs were made based on the radar reflectivity factor only. So the polarimetric estimates uh, utilizing uh, two polarimetric variables, differential reflectivity, specific differential phase, CDI and KDP, respectively have been practiced uh, once um, uh, polarimetry become available on the operational uh, weather radar networks. And uh, the combination of Z and ZDI was utilized for light and moderate rain and uh, uh, specific differential waves KDP uh, if rain mixed with hail. However, relatively uh, marginal QP improvement uh, was reported uh, partially due to the problems with absolute calibration of differential reflectivity. Um, however, uh, the introduction of the algorithms using specific attenuation A uh, was a real game changer. Uh, the MRMS group, uh, multi radar multi sensor group at, at uh, National Service of Laboratory, started providing um, uh, these new estimates on the rainfall to NSEP since October 2020. Although the official uh, next rat rainfall product is still based on. RZZDR. And some of the, the river forecast centers have already started using uh, the MRMS product, uh, which paves its way to accept an extra stage four data set. And this slide demonstrates uh, why the ROV algorithm became a, game, became a game changer. So specific attenuation, which can be estimated only with polarimetric radar, uh, this uh, variable at S band is almost linearly depends on, on, on the rain rate. And that is why the scatter plot uh, of rain rate versus uh, its estimate for specific attenuation is, a, is the narrowest compared to standard R of Z relation, R of Z ZDR, and R of KDP relation. So that means that uh, this R of A relation is least sensitive to the DSD variability of a wide range of rain intensity. And this is another slide that demonstrating the same, uh, <clears throat> the same advantage. Uh, it shows that. Um, uh, the dependence of uh, fractional mean uh, absolute error uh, uh, of, of rain rate estimations, the function of rain rate. So black curve R of Z, green curve R of Z, ZDR, blue R of KDP, red R of A. It's obviously clear that uh, the uh, switching to R of A algorithm will dramatically improve um, uh, rainfall estimation, at least up to the uh, rain rates of 60, 70 uh, millions per hour. And uh, after that, we have to switch pro to our KDP, specific differential phase. Uh, of course, uh, the DSD variability is a primary sort of uncertainty in all um, um, uh, rather rainfall est uh, estimate estimations. And uh, it's great that uh, the ROV, ROV KDP estimators are less sensitive to DSD variability than the the ones based on radar reflectivity and differential reflectivity. But more to, add, more to it, as opposed to Z and ZDR, uh, these two variables, A and KDP, are immune to radar miscalibration, partial beam blockage, and attenuation in rain and uh, wet radar. Now, this slide uh, shows the impact of partial beam blockage caused by nearby trees on the uh, uh, left panel. And uh, uh, this impact is completely eliminated if we utilize uh, um, phase-based, actually R of A, R of KDP, the measurements in uh, generating rental maps. Uh, this, uh, 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 the performance of this uh, new latest uh, R of A, R of KDP algorithm in terms of daily rain totals uh, for the three PMP grade storms of the summer 2021 is illustrated in this slide. So the biases, if you look at the scatter plots, the, the biases, one of them is Tennessee flash flood, another is uh, Hurricane Ida, when it simply went off the uh, Gulf uh, to Louisiana, and when it uh, finished its uh, path uh, through the continental United States in the New York City region. So in all three um, uh, occasions, uh, the performance uh, of this algorithm is almost superb. No, practically no bias and uh, very high uh, cross-correlation, another co correlation coefficient. In other words, 
uh, the bias is uh, uh, usually less than 10% and uh, uh, correlation coefficient is well above 0.9. And uh, uh, the reason uh, the polarimetric radar QP methodologies are particularly beneficial uh, for estimation of uh, something that matches the definition of PMP, very high storm totals or extreme rain in anomalously high rain rates. It's because uh, the, the essence, because the integral of these two variables, special temporal integral, uh, they are large. And uh, the first scenario is usually tropical cyclone, landfall, and hurricanes. They don't produce extreme instantaneous rain rate, but uh, the rain totals can be extremely high. And the second scenario, continental rain associated with the so MCS coal lines or tornadic hail bearing supercell when we have extreme precipitation over relatively small area and over a um, uh, short period of time. Uh, existing climatological catalogs of rainfall data such as NOAA uh, uh, ARRC or NOAA Atlas 14 contain only uh, surface uh, hourly rain totals. So uh, there is a need to capture vertical profile of precipitation and uh, understand microphysical process of precipitation formation. If we need to understand the nature of these uh, PMP storms and predict um, the, uh, the climatology of those sort of events. So for this purpose, and not only for this purpose, we develop novel methodologies for processing representation of the, uh, of the rather data such as quasi-vertical profiles, column the vertical profiles, which probably not uh, um, uh, well known by say hydrological community and so on. And uh, uh, these are, uh, have been introduced for better understanding of mechanism of precipitation formation. Uh, usually uh, what we did for range defined, uh, what, what uh, QVP or uh, uh, QVP, so for every volume scan, uh, the polarimetric radar data collected at uh, various elevation angles are immutably averaged and projected onto the vertical. And the resulting vertical profiles for successive volume scans are stuck together and presented in the uh, height versus time format, which uh, allows us to capture uh, the vertical structure of the storm producing precipitation and also its uh, mm, uh, it's temporal evolution. So the uh, the column, the vertical prof. Uh, this is a basic brother centric product, and uh, the column, the vertical evolution uh, uh, profiles uh, explore the same idea. But uh, the column can be anywhere put in the uh, uh, field of view of the radar. So, and this is simply example of the uh, uh, novel representation of the. Uh, vertical structure of the uh, precipitation producing storms and their uh, temporal evolution. So this example for uh, uh, the last year hurricane iron. So even uh, without much knowledge about the, uh, sorry, about, about my knowledge about the uh, <clears throat> Uh, nitty gritty details of polarimetric uh, measurements, it's obvious that uh, these multi parameter measurements uh, provide uh, different variables, provide very complementary information that uh, definitely elucidates the microphysics of uh, precipitation formation much better than just single radar reflectivity, which is shown in the, in the uh, upper uh, panel. And it's also very important to distinguish between contribution of warm and cold rain to its uh, total amount for PMP magnitude storm. So warm rain in the rain that is produced by uh, collision coalescence process uh, just close to the surface uh, where ice doesn't play much role. And cold rain is uh, the rain that is mostly produced from melting uh, gravel uh, and ice. So in the vertical gradients of rather reflectivity and two other polarimetric variables, KDP and ZDR, below the melting layer, they characterize warm rain component, whereas uh, KDP, if you look at this very nice signature of KDP of the, about the melting layer, uh, this, uh, for, for this time uh, period of the iron, this is uh, characterized the contribution of the cold component. Uh, 
Okay. And uh, we have to figure out how all these uh, climate changes will affect uh, the sources of cold and warm rain. Uh, here are the, uh, here the, uh, are the typical um, RDQVPs or CVPs that we are producing for uh, uh, different hurricanes, so Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane uh, Florence. Uh, so just to give you uh, uh, information uh, and how, how it looks like. So, uh, so this uh, then uh, what we what we did uh, on the top of that, uh, we also develop uh, the polarimetric rather um, microphysical retrieval techniques to estimate uh, microphysical parameters of clouds and precipitation, such as liquid water content, ice water content. Uh, mean volume diameter, uh, total number concentration, both in rain and ice. And the results of the co corresponding retrievals uh, for the same uh, QVPs that I show here are uh, demonstrated in this slide. So we see how the uh, vertical profiles of ice water content and liquid water content uh, evolve for these two hurricanes, how uh, particle sizes uh, changes and how particle concentration changes. So this gives us a full um, uh, uh, understanding and, uh, uh, and view of the underlying microphysics, which is, uh, which is very important. So, and uh, um, such products for um, the most notable PMP uh, great storms, which all, all of these storms are uh, PMP definitely, uh, PMP magnitude. Uh, this uh, products can be generated very quickly, and we suggested already to augment the NOAA uh, analysis uh, or, or records for calibration precipitation data set by adding vertical profiles of all microphysical parameters of clouds and precipitations for all notable uh, PMP magnitude storms for last 10 years after uh, uh, polarimetric upgrade of the uh, uh, WSRTD start. So we uh, we can re, uh, can do reanalysis of those type of uh, of this uh, polarimetric um, uh, extra rather data. You know there is not a very uh, uh, long uh, time interval to predict uh, long term tendencies, but uh, this is already a decade of polarimetric uh, weather radar observations, and we have to utilize the most advanced algorithm to. Uh, to quantify precipitation. So we already uh, uh, started building the climatology of vertical uh, profiles of polarimetric radar variables and microphysical parameters of precipitations uh, uh, on the, uh, uh, and our preliminary effort is described in a recent paper uh, where we examine large number of uh, uh, storms of different types and generate climatological uh, profiles demonstrating um, uh, for example, the profound differences between uh, uh, continental and tropical storm. For example, for continental storm, uh, in the continental storm, uh, size, two minutes left. Yes. Okay. Two minutes. Yes. All right. Okay. I'll, 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 I'm close to finishing. So, uh, for example, uh, mean volume diameter uh, uh, of ice particles is much, much larger in continental storm that for than for. Uh, tropical storm of the sort of same rather similar rather reflectivity. And the concentration of ice is very, very uh, larger for, uh, uh, for tropical storm as opposed to continental storm. And this actually uh, has strong impact and correlation with the, with the rain actually is produced, which is produced at the surface. So this is very important to understand. The short duration and small area rainfall extremes is a Another big area of research, the big challenge. And here we are talking about time scales shorter than three hours and special scales smaller than 300 square kilometers. Uh, the problem is the nature and origin of such, such rain extreme is not well understood. These are commonly associated with deep convective storms, which include those that are capable of producing tornadoes in large hail. But sometimes, of course, uh, within this uh, continental uh, deep convective storms, when we see obvious core of uh, tropical rain, or warm rain process, that's very interesting and challenging situation to 
uh, understand and uh, uh, understand the mechanism for that PMP uh, precipitation. So, and uh, what we also found is that peaks of extreme rain exceeding 100, 200 millimeters per hour often underestimated by existing radar QPE techniques, especially uh, including even polarimetric ones, although they are much better than uh, Z-based. And one of the hypotheses is that uh, these rain extreme are often coupled with convective downdrafts where uh, traditional QP methods underestimate rainfall uh, because they don't take into account high downdraft velocity. And uh, rainfall is a precipitation flux, it's a product of mass and, uh, uh, and vertical velocity. Uh, and again, in the downdrafts, we have a sum of the uh, thermal velocity of uh, uh, raindrops in steel air and uh, vertical downward velocity. So uh, underestimation is uh, inevitable. Uh, so here I just show a couple of, uh, at, the, at the very end of my presentation, a couple of uh, uh, examples of uh, these sort of uh, storms that produces extreme, extremely, extreme high, uh, uh, they're extreme in all accounts. So for example, this El Reno uh, storm in, in a, uh, uh, outskirts of Oklahoma City, the tornadic storm on May 31st, 2013. Uh, this storm uh, uh, resulted in E5, F5 tornado, 16 centimeter size hail and torrential rain that caused uh, 12 flash flood fatalities. So, uh, and uh, these are, uh, this is uh, reconstructed RHIs, uh, the PPIs of the radar reflectivity, specific differential phase, and same differential reflectivity cross correlation coefficient. So, uh, and again, the most notable uh, feature is anomalously high specific differential phase uh, next to the surface. And uh, uh, if you look at the similar storm of the in the Ellicott City in Maryland, May 27, 2018, also produced. A uh, huge amount of uh, rainfall. <laughs> you see the same sort of a feature of specific differential uh, phase, which is with anomalously high values uh, of 12 degrees per kilometer. If we convert them into rainfall, it will be almost 300 uh, millimeters per hour, whatever, during short period of time. So, see, and finally, um, uh, finally, my conclusions. Okay, you can read it or can, I can, uh, I can uh, repeat them. Anyway, this rather parameter offers significant improvement in the quality of rainfall search, particularly for PMP magnitude storms. Uh, and we plan to uh, reanalyze uh, ATAD polarimetric radar data back to the uh, date of inception, which is 2013, to use the absolute, the, the, the most advanced PPE algorithm. And we, uh, uh, we insist that uh, we have to uh, analyze and uh, uh, examine, the, examine the vertical structure of the PMP magnitude storms in order to understand microphysical uh, processes for information and predict uh, how these processes respond to climate change. And this is an next frontier of research and uh, 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 a very interesting uh, subject is uh, detection estimating of extreme short duration rainfall, which is associated with deep uh, convective storm. Okay, uh, uh, thanks for your attention. Yeah, I'm, I stop at the moment. Move on to questions, and let's see any. Um, I'll, I'll pick off. So there, uh, Alexander. There are a lot of uh, there are operational data sets, radar data sets that go back. Um, to the, uh, the pre-polar metric era. Uh, what are your suggestions on how to proceed in uh, developing uh, storm catalogs of extreme events? Is it this very detailed examination um, of storms where you characterize, or you both estimate rainfall and characterize air structure, or are there ways that we can build on uh, some of the either uh, operational or reanalysis uh, radar data sets in an effective way? Uh, you know, first of all, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, a lot of RZ relations that work have been used in the past 
some of them for tropical rains, some from for, for continental rain, then uh, even uh, ex pre uh, polarimetric next rat units, at least five of those relations. Uh, so uh, using polarimetry, uh, polarimetric estimates that actually have been obtained only starting from 2013, we can uh, probably recommend, make recommendations which of R of Z relation uh, uh, out of the multitude of R of Z relations can be uh, recommended for any particular situation based on a, on a general analysis and uh, morphology of the storm. So, and uh, uh, unfortunately, I don't believe that we can do much on the top of that, at least from my perspective. Let's see. Um, now we've got a question that's come in. Um, uh, how do you see combining um, rain gauge observations? What's the role of rain gauge observations in developing um, rainfall estimates, combining polar metric measurements? I think that's the gist of the question. Yeah, of, of course, it's, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the, the rain gauges should be used for uh, validation. Uh, but very often, you know, we are, uh, we see that uh, you know you have to trust rather more than than rain gauge, especially uh, for all this hurricane with the hurricane strength wind actually causes huge underestimation of uh, rainfall measured by uh, rain gauges. So, but apparently you know that's uh, so far we don't see anything else, nothing better for uh, ground validation that rain gauges. Uh, John, John E. Hi, Alexander. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Quick question on um, besides rain gauges, uh, merging the issues on merging multiple radars together for merging to make estimates. Um, do you have any comments on that and the challenges? Say you're in Tennessee and you're trying to combine three radars three polarimetric radars to make the best spatial estimate of rainfall. Um, okay, uh, I can tell you, I can tell you. First of all, this uh, uh, our multi-radar, multi-sensor group uh, at the National Severe Storms Laboratory is already doing that. And uh, I, I, I know that a lot of uh, customers prefer MRMS products uh, <laughs> as compared to the uh, uh, sort of uh, official Dextra product because they do this sort of a uh, composition. But what is good about those uh, uh, estimates based on specific attenuation and KDP is that uh, they are uh, uh, very good for uh, compositing and for merging because they are not affected and biased by, for example, different uh, mm -hmm. rather miscalibration errors attenuation uh, uh, effects and so on. And what we did actually with great success, we have this, uh, our Northern neighbor Canada that operated uh, say C-band uh, network until recently, now they're changing to S-band network frequency. Okay, and what we did, we, we simply uh, use uh, all this uh, KDP or uh, A-based estimate of rainfall on the Canadian side and on the American side. And we found out that uh, their merging and uh, compositing is much, much easier uh, than if we try to do something based on radar reflectivity <laughs> and, or differential reflectivity that requires very careful uh, calibration and also some uh, 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 errors uh, um, uh, associated with, for example, uh, attenuation uh, of uh, uh, microwave at uh, shorter wavelength at C-band, for example. So, and this, in other words, we also probably may have some sort of a forthcoming the network of gap fillers at X-band that operated X-band at very short wavelength in the, in the United States. And I do believe that uh, using those principles based on the use of uh, specific iteration differential phase, these are, uh, these are uh, the perfect platform for integrating uh, the data from different radars. Thanks okay. so much. Let's see. Uh, any other questions for Alexander? 
at this point. Um, um, I let's see a, a question that um, uh, basically looking at integrated uh, aerial precipitation uh, problems with uh, with rain gauges that you note is there any utility of bringing in uh, stream gauge uh, observations uh, any thoughts on that uh, you know we never I, I personally never worked with this uh, uh, stream gauges and so because I believe it was in the realm of uh, hydrological sciences but uh, science but uh, 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 de definitely because all stream gauges they some sort of they they provide some sort of a cumulative um, a, amount of water that uh, fall uh, uh, that, that falls over relatively large area depending on the, uh, say rain relief whatever it's very important to uh, measure uh, this water that uh, uh, that falls over relatively large area. And again, as I mentioned in one of my slides, you know, this all these polarimetric methods are particularly well, particularly well working for aerial estimates, for aerial estimates or long-term estimates. So in other words, the scale should be uh, uh, large in order to, or, or probably the intensive precipitation should be high. So this, I'm, I'm sure that it's definitely a big, uh, big help for, uh, for, for hydrology and uh, to estimate the hydrological impact on a the, on the, on the big scale. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Alexander. That's uh, uh, going to be very useful in uh, guiding our thought on how to look at really extreme rain events. Um, we'll switch over now to, uh, to Dan Wright. Uh, from the University of Wisconsin. All right. Can you see my slides? And, yes. And you can hear me okay, I guess, too, as well. Okay, Good. great. Um, all right. So I was only given one question to answer, but um, it's a big one. And so I'll do my best here. Uh, so how should storm catalogs of extreme rainfall events be constructed for modernized PMP analyses? So I do want to say a little bit about the perspective that I'm coming at this from. Um, and so my research group for some time now has worked on something that we call process-based flood frequency analysis. And so I'm not gonna go into a lot of details here, but I will do a little bit. And so what we're doing in our work is, is generating lots of what I'll call flood recipes. So extreme rainfall events uh, combined with other seasonal, seasonably appropriate um, initial conditions, uh, so antecedent soil moisture, antecedent snowpack, uh, and base flow, et cetera. And then using those all together uh, in uh, distributed rainfall runoff models to generate large numbers of flood events in Monte Carlo style simulations. And then from that, looking at the outputs for flood quantiles and looking at this whole chain of events to see what the physical drivers of those quantiles are. And so where storm catalogs fit into this is through our use of a technique known as stochastic storm transposition, which basically is a, a resampling approach where we create a collection of storms from gridded rainfall data over some relatively large region that surrounds a watershed of interest in order to uh, support our understanding of rainfall frequency and flood frequency over our watershed of interest. Um, and so we've used a variety of different data sets, but essentially any gridded rainfall data that we can get our hands on, we've probably used. And so um, this figure that you're seeing here is just one example from the work that we've done. It's the example that's the closest to PMP relevance. Uh, this is work that was funded by uh, the Bureau of Reclamation, and you'll see here that we were um, generating recurrence in, uh, interval estimates out to 10,000 years, in this case, using this stochastic storm transposition to generate our rainfall events for this flood frequency analysis. I'm going to spare you a lot of the details on what's going on here, but the point is that we were doing this probabilistic work with storm catalogs to get at flood frequencies 
for rare events, and we backstop those using a variety of statistical, paleo flood, and deterministic uh, methods to, to kind of show that the whole story hangs together and that this kind of approach can get at PMP relevant types of events. So I'll just share some perspectives on why to use storm catalogs. Um, <clears throat> I, I like to say that uh, extreme storms happen all the time. That's not technically true, but um, it is not so far off the mark. As long as you look at a relatively large region, um, extreme storms or storms are the extreme storms are only really rare from the perspective of a watershed or a rain gauge. Um, and so uh, the fact that you know really large storms happen over larger areas can help support your analyses. From there, um, what I'll call second order rainfall properties, uh, where first order is the amount of rain that falls. So second order here being uh, when and where it falls within a storm are really important determinants of flood magnitude. And, and I think most folks on the call are, are, are familiar with this in general, but you know, floods are the result of very complicated interlocking time and space scales of the rainfall and the watershed that it's hitting, right? And so those second order properties are things that point scale analyses such as uh, rain gauge based frequency and trend analyses they miss out on. Storm catalogs, on the other hand, especially if you've got good rainfall data going into them, give a really good sampling of this uh, within storm variability, not only because you've got you know, individual storms, but you've got a whole set of them that you can look at to understand a wide range of, of what uh, this variability could look like across uh, seasons and across years. And, and along with that, that can help get around some of the rules of thumb that so much uh, flood frequency and PMP work is tied up in, you know, things around time of concentration and rainfall duration and things of that nature by actually being able to sample from the real observed variability of rainfall. And then the third point is what I'll call the arrival property. So in this case, it's really thinking about not what's happening within the storms, but what can we learn from looking at the collection of storms in its totality. And so basically when and where these storms occur within a region, so how often storms are happening, during what seasons they're happening, and uh, over the region that we're looking, are there important differences in the properties of these storms? So where can storm catalogs come from? Uh, well, there are literally storm catalogs. That one pictured, I've got it also right here. Um, and so these are basically paper records um, that uh, are going to have things like isohydal maps, depth area duration data for historical storms with, uh, with emphasis on the historical part, because these are oftentimes quite old records. And um, I'll say a little bit more about these in a moment, but they have some strengths and some limitations. Um, I'll plug a little bit some of the work that, well, specifically the software that, that we've created in my group known as Rainy Day, um, moving into sort of more modern options here. So um, it, this is the software that we use to do our stochastic storm transposition work, but to get it started, the user can define a number of different things around rainfall characteristics that they want that uh, storm catalog to be based on, and then they can also define which gridded rainfall data set they'd like to use. And then from there, Rainy Day will identify however many of the most extreme storms the user is interested in, whether that's 10 or whether that's 1,000. And I won't dwell on this too much, but it is uh, it also produces sort of diagnostic plots of, over here you see a couple of plots out of the software from uh, within storm uh, variability, right? So that's second order uh, rainfall properties that I mentioned. And then also uh, some diagnostics of the storm catalog itself. So here we're just looking at a rectangular domain, um, 400 or so storms, the dots are the centroids of those storms. And you can see basically where they're occurring, how often they're occurring, and means and standard deviations. And there does a few other things as well. Um, 
some aspects uh, of what we've done have inspired uh, bits of um, things that are happening now within FEMA's Future of Flood Risk Data Initiative. And so they um, have uh, tasked uh, FEMA has tasked the Army Corps of Engineers Hydrologic Engineering Center, who has then subtasked uh, Dewberry to start creating uh, storm catalogs using this AORC uh, precipitation data set that's about 40 years long at this point. And you can see some screenshots from, the, from their um, uh, very preliminary prototype of this. And so this is, here's this larger domain that they're identifying a storm catalog from to support analyses of a smaller watershed here. Um, and they're um, in the future gonna be working towards uh, things like storm typing and, and supporting different types of analyses around seasonality as well. And then this is actually going to be um, a, a key input for an initial phase of, of about $2 billion of floodplain mapping under that initiative using HEC HMS specifically. Okay, so I think storm catalogs are great, but there are certainly some limitations around them. And so I wanna talk about those for a moment here. Um, we're, we're really saying these are a collection of rainfall events from a region that can support our, you know, our analyses, but that then instantly raises the question, well, what should that region be, right? So here in Wisconsin, I think that I can learn something about extreme rainfall that could happen in Madison by things that have happened over the border in Minnesota or in Iowa, for example. But I don't think that I should be trying to learn anything from what happened in California or Florida. And so that suggests that some amount of, let's say, homogeneity across this region over which you're assembling these storm catalogs is necessary, but it's really not obvious what that homo what, what that actually should mean, right? Homogeneity with respect to just rainfall, with respect to uh, water vapor transport or other variables. Um, some work that's been done on other areas like rainfall frequency analysis have some relevance there, but I think when it comes to um, whether it's the probabilistic work that I'm doing or whether it's uh, PMP work that the committee is tasked with, that um, some more focused uh, work is needed. Uh, we are doing some stuff related to this for our, our uh, rainfall and flood frequency work using stochastic storm transposition. I, I just wanted to show you two figures from previous papers of ours. So um, here we're looking, this was from a paper where we were looking at flood frequency for this watershed in northeastern Iowa. And our storm catalog covered this rectangular domain here. And you might say, well, why is it a rectangle? And the basic answer is it doesn't matter very much. You could draw a different rectangle. You could probably draw a circle, something of a somewhat different size. And through sensitivity analysis, we showed that really for our frequency assessments, it didn't matter a whole lot. And that's fundamentally because to a first order approximation, rainfall is roughly homogeneous across the part of the country. Whereas over here, this was a study of the Big Thompson watershed in Colorado um, up here. and in this case, in red, we see the transposition domain that we used, and I'll spare you the details on how we created it, but essentially it follows the front range of the Rockies east of the continental divide. And so we're trying to restrict our storm catalog to only include storms that are gonna have kind of the same, to a, again, a rough approximation anyways, or a graphic enhancement and, and other features. Dan, two minutes. Okay, I'll, uh, yep, I should be able to get there. Okay, so um, so uh, we're working on uh, developing a hypothesis testing sort of approach to develop domains uh, uh, or regions for storm catalog development. Um, and I think in the interest of time, I will move ahead to some of these other issues. So storm typing, I mentioned this before, you know, relatively easy for certain types of storms where they're fairly clearly defined. Um, phenomena in the atmosphere harder for others, although some work has been done. Um, different types of storms really matter a lot for floods at different scales. So I'll try to keep this quick, but here we see some work from my PhD where we're looking at a, a 10, 110 square kilometer watershed in Charlotte, North Carolina. The flood frequency was really determined entirely by tropical cyclones. And then within the exactly the same watershed, but a smaller subcatchment, 
For the upper tail, tropical cyclone didn't matter at all, right? And so different storms, different types of storms matter a lot at different scales. And then of course, climate change will affect these different types of storms unevenly. Um, I think we've already heard about data quality issues. So maybe I will skip that for at least the more modern data sets. Um, and then for the sort of these paper records, uh, they're limited to older time periods, limited or inconsistent in the types and amount of information provided and um, in you know, basically whether they're providing enough, um, whether certain storms in some parts of the country are being left out of those records for one reason or another. So I'll just close now with five recommendations and this is my last slide. Um, so I mentioned that flood response, it is this complex result of these interlocking spatial and temporal scales. And so the fact that storm catalogs can provide you with multiple different storms with different uh, rainfall properties, um, even if you're not doing a full-blown probabilistic analysis, I think that some degree of sampling from that catalog can help remove some of the guesswork around, you know, essentially what critical uh, time scales and spatial scales might be. Um, I do, uh, while I acknowledge some of the limitations that were pointed out about um, uh, the pre-polarimetric or non-polarimetric data in uh, earlier records, I do think there's a lot of value in these, and we've demonstrated that in a number of our uh, research efforts. Um, I do think, again, <clears throat> though, that there's value in these earlier storm reports, and that some of the sort of shortcomings of them uh, particularly with respect to inconsistent sampling is not so important for PMP as it is for uh, flood frequency analysis. And then <clears throat> I do think that um, if we're going to develop storm catalogs, we need ways of defining what sort of regions uh, they can be uh, based on and um, not only based on precipitation properties, but also uh, other atmospheric fields from the analysis. And I think we'll hear hear some more relevant uh, perspectives on that later. And then I would suggest looking at related federal efforts that are going on, uh, primarily through that future of flood risk data initiative, although on the regional homogeneity, I suspect that Atlas 14 and 15 have some, uh, some things to offer as well. So I will stop there. Jim, I think you're muted. Effie. Uh, thanks, Dan, for, for the very interesting presentation. And thank you for bringing back to, we do not care for PMP, just for the sake of PMP. We care about you know the flooding and therefore the types, the orientation, the space-time intricate properties are very important. I can have the same storm in a different orientation over the water set and can make a big difference. Uh, so just I wanted to point out this, that we have, yes, our task is PMP, but we should not forget all the properties that we need to look at uh, for the things that we care, the floods. W one thing that, you, do you think that, or do you have an evidence that the homogeneous areas for the storm transposition kind of have, may have, major, in some cases, major changes under a warming climate? Yeah, that's a good question. We have not, well, I was going to say we have not looked at that very closely. Um, I have with some longer term gridded rain gauge records. So there are some gridded uh, rain gauge data sets that are 75 years long or more. And so I've done some sort of split sample sort of things, and you can find very big differences um, in, in what might seem somewhat reasonable in terms of these homogeneity metrics, although uh, it's not something that I've really taken far enough to you know be publishable, for example. And it's also difficult, I think, to know how much of that really is a climate change signal and how much of that is, is just more natural variability. Mm -hmm. So I'm Thank not you. sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, two questions queued up, Shi Chi and then Johnny. 
Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. It's really uh, interesting. So um, I, my question is about, uh, curious about your experience about, about AORC because it's a more recent data set. And uh, uh, I'm wondering, have you can you comment on that? In particular, there are some other graded database that has been used by the community, although they are at a daily scale, like Prism, mm, um, yeah. Daymat, and others. So, uh, uh, so that comment is more like, uh, what would be your recommendation if you're moving forward? Should we use those greedy database or should we always go back to co-op and stuff from there? Thank you. Yeah, great question. So as far as AORC goes, I actually don't have a ton of experience with it. This is, um, uh, my group is gearing up with a bunch of new fresh faces and fresh projects and we are moving forward. We're gonna be using AORC in the past. We've concentrated a lot on stage four and on, um, and LDAS to both of which, you know, have some strengths and weaknesses and particularly depending on which part of the country you're looking in, but they both have relatively high temporal resolution. Um, and let's say, well, it depends on which data set you're talking about the spatial resolution, but point being you asked about daily data. Um, I, I think that it's very important that at some point in this process of going from you know, the atmosphere to the flooding, you have to be able to inject high resolution information, right? Uh, it, meaning that I don't think that we can just rely on daily data, daily rainfall data uh, to carry us through to flooding. Now, there can be a lot of uses to learn valuable things from daily rainfall data, um, but uh, but I would really encourage a focus on on higher resolution data when it comes to actually generating the inputs to uh, hydrologic and hydraulic modeling. Thank you. You're welcome. John. Thanks, Dan, for the wonderful presentation as usual. Um, my questions on the flooding, like sort of your first bullet and the ties to older PMP ideas, especially US, uh, sorry, Eastern US and HMR 51. So the question is, what are your thoughts on mixtures of rainfall signatures to cause those floods? Uh, everybody hopefully is aware that HMR 51 uh, uses a composite um, for all the rain events, including MCSs and convection and cyclones. And what are your thoughts on still doing that? Yeah, I I must admit that um, I have not read, <laughs> I'm not as widely read as you are on on that uh, on that, you know, on, sure. on some of those things. And so, um, I guess so. When you say mixtures, you're thinking about mixtures on just the rainfall side of things. Just the rainfall. So it uses a yeah. single event, essentially. You know, yeah. 72 hours incorporates yeah. a six hour duration, incorporates all these other things. Yeah. With the Western US, they broke it out into shorter durations. And some of the newer yeah. statewide studies um, go on this path of, of mixtures and separating out by type. Yeah, it's a good question. I, <clears throat> I think that that idea of sort of mixing events together to create some you know, catch all event is um, gives me some pause. I'm not sure how to do it. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that a lot of uh, good thought went into that back in the day. Um, I guess my initial thought or another thought though, is that just that I don't think we need to do that anymore uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that I think that um, between the, the data resources that exist now and these gridded data sets but and and maybe particularly the fact that the army corps and and fema will be developing storm catalogs that are ready for heck hms for uh, for example um and then on top of that that heck hms and to some degree or another other modern hydrologic modeling software have all the tools needed to uh, ingest these sorts of data there's no reason why we can't be thinking about individual, you know, if not thousands of runs like my group does, then a dozen or a hundred or something and that can typically be handled in some batch fashion in, in modern modeling software. Hopefully I answered that question properly. <laughs> ah, great, thanks so much. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
Let's see. Uh, Dan, a follow up on the to the high value in um, AORC and stage four and th thinking of stage four and um, and stochastic storm transposition or uh, or transposition for PMP. Um, you know, doesn't it essentially just depend on the largest value? And if so, um, shouldn't we really focus our efforts on getting the largest value right? And, yeah. and is this the right vehicle in that case? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and, and with the uh, for PMP, that is, well, how should I say this? It will, that, that largest value will drive any sort of probabilistic analysis like stochastic storm transposition on extreme upper tail. Um, so that is true. I think um, <clears throat> what I would still encourage folks to think about is uh, whether that, particularly that second order variability that I described about, you know, when and where the rain is falling within storms, um, it, that can still be useful from smaller storm events. I'm not, it, you know, some of the, there's some diminishment of the importance of that second order variability as you move to rarer and rarer events, but it by no means goes away, at least as far as I've been able to see. The other point there is that, um, and this is maybe, we don't have time to get into a larger discussion of this, but, you know, I think that the seasonality issues that a storm catalog approach can reveal can also be pretty important in terms of maybe revealing possibilities around um, snowpack and um, soil moisture conditions as well, right? So, uh, so just understanding how the land surface is lining up seasonally with uh, when the those biggest storms might be possible. Good. Let's see, any other questions? Okay, um, so at this point, we'll take um, a five minute break and, uh, and reconvene uh, with our uh, second session. Okay, we should be back up and running. Okay, excellent. Thanks for being patient, everybody. And of course, I get uh, all that time back at the end, right? I'm sure. All right. So we'll have some uh, more discussion on this as we go through um, some of these processes. But again, the bottom line is in the SPAS catalog development we've been doing over the years, all these aspects are kind of part of the process and really imp incremental improvements through time. Being able to utilize that storm data for temporal evaluations, spatial evaluations. We you've talked already about transposition limits and how important that is in understanding things, quantifying uncertainty of the parameters that go into the SPAS process. All these things should be part of the storm catalog going forward and are part of the process that we do now. And one of the key aspects of the SPAS process that we utilized was trying to have a way to incorporate old information, pre-radar data with new information and really good information utilizing NEXRAD and polar metric radar that we talked about earlier. How to put all those pieces into one database in a consistent way that could be utilized uh, for PMP development and other analyses. Again, as part of that process, I mean, uh, this is not our first rodeo. These are all PMP studies we've done around the world. The only reason I'm showing this slide is for is two, two, two aspects. One is we have been fortunate enough to deal with storm and extreme rainfall and PMP type events in just about every meteorological setting you can imagine from equatorial regions to Arctic regions and everything in between, right? So why does that matter? Because that gives us a really good sense of just how important it is to, to quantify rainfall accumulation in time, space, and magnitude in a consistent way uh, for use in design and development of PMP by storm type, by season, and so on, and see what issues come out of all of those aspects. Every location has unique challenges, unique types of meteorology, unique questions that have to be answered uh, for storm characterization, storm transposition limits, and putting all those pieces together from an end-to-end -end process to actually get PMP that's used in design is a, a critical part of the process, of course. And so having that context and understanding is, is very important. So having that work all over the world on PMP development really helps to have that spots catalog in a place 
that's usable going forward for these types of discussions. And that was a little bit of background, of course, all of you hopefully are familiar with the HMRs and what's gone into them. These are just examples of the storms that were used in the various HMRs, HMR 51, HMR 55A, and then of course 57, 59. You know, and, and because these are all storm-based approaches, you know, there's there really was a dearth of information used uh, available for a lot of those studies. I mean, very much a lack of storm data in the coastal mountains and central areas of California and in the eastern parts of Washington and Oregon and high elevations of the Rockies. I mean, um, to think that we could come up with uh, the information we did in those HMRs is pretty incredible. There were some very smart people doing a lot of great work with limited data. And of course, now we have so much more information and so many other ways to incorporate reanalysis data, next red weather radar data, the stuff that Dan's group was working on at Wisconsin and putting all those pieces together into one big database. And of course, our part of the puzzle is the SPAS database. You know, we've analyzed over a thousand or nearly a thousand storms now over the last 20 years since 2002. And the, the point of that is that we've done it in a consistent manner the whole time. Of course, there's been improvements through time, incorporating an extra weather radar, for example, and other uh, types of storm typing and, and so on. But that that's part of the big catalog and database that needs to be done. So we want to answer the questions of what's next and what's going forward. Well, the first thing is we can't really know what's next until we know what we've already done, right? So with the SPAS process, just for a quick reference, started in 2002, we have a consistent algorithm that we use to analyze rainfall. The big key importance is that we utilize all of the above, right? There's been a lot of discussions today already on which data sets are the best, how to use each one, how they all work individually, and so on. We put it, we're agnostic. We want it all. We want all the data. And then when we take it in, we want to use the best of each data source and put that together as one uh, type of output, right? So we're using observational data. We're using, we're doing our own bucket surveys at times. We're using uh, next red, red radar that's been uh, dynamically adjusted on an hourly basis. We're using model reanalysis data when available to help distribute things. We're using satellite remote sensing information to help identify storms and spatially di distribute processes. Everything gets thrown into the bucket. And to me, that's a key component to any storm catalog going forward is to use the best of all of those data sets that have been talked about already and will be talked about going forward and put in this. Uh, one key component really that's, that's so important for PMP development is to understand the limitations of each piece and how those affect the outcomes, right? So when you talk about reanalysis or ARR, those are great for, for identifying an individual event or, or seasonality or, or just general conditions across a region, but they're not very good when it comes to explicit accuracy, which you might need for PMP design and evaluation when you're designing for critical infrastructure, right? So you have to understand that. Next red weather radar or polymetric radar we talked about before, Unkept, uncorrected uh, ZR relationships don't do a great job, especially with extreme rainfall. I mean, when, when you do that with it, when it's not been properly calibrated and adjusted to observational data, you're going to have issues with the outcomes. Unfortunately, observational data also has its own issues and uncertainty. There's no perfect metric out there. So you have to use the best of all the worlds to kind of come up with an answer. Um, you know, this is just an example on the right side here of, an, of a single hour of accumulation with a blue line here being the default ZR relationship for this particular storm event. This is actually September 2009 in Georgia. We had extreme flooding and, and a couple of dam failures and so on. Well, we have the blue dots here being the actual observational data and the black line being an exponential best fit of those data. And you can see the difference in that one single reflectivity run between those two data sets. And if you put that over the entire storm time frame, you have a huge difference in the amount of reflectivity and hence accumulation from a standard ZR relationship versus a SPAS corrected uh, ZR relationship. And you can imagine what difference that makes in the magnitude of rainfall accumulation. So that's just one example of how the SPAS process really corrects for that and, and takes all the data and information available to come up with a much more accurate uh, data set. Now, we can say that and wave our hands all we want, but we still have to prove that the SPAS process works. And if we're going to use it in a storm catalog type of analysis, we have to have proof of concept and so on. So where did SPAS come from? Of course, like most good science, it came out of necessity when we started doing these PMP studies. We had to have a way to utilize the DADs from the HMRs with updated information and depth area duration information for PMP development. So it was produced and set up following guidance and uh, processes that were described 
um, in Technical Paper 1 in 1946 and ongoing from the Bureau of Reclamation, Army Corps of Engineers, and so on, in producing their DADs, and then utilizing that information with current state of the science uh, information and processes, um, such as, you know, obviously GIS, um, uh, computing power, uh, next red weather radar, and so on. And then trying to make sure that the processes developed were consistent between the old and the new, so we could continue to use the old data with the new information. And we proved that through obviously functionality testing, uh, where we have a, a known answer and a known process, and we can kind of go through and see how the SPAS process computes those known answers through time and how it degrades through time and make sure that it fits that process and is doing exactly what it's programmed to do. And that did go through the NRC's validation verification process uh, back in 2017. And then, of course, con comparing SPAS output and DAD to older storms. So uh, one of the first things we did back in way back in 2002, 2003, was to take a SPAS DAD of the 1955 um, um, Westfield, Massachusetts storm from uh, Hurricane, uh, I believe it was Diane, I can't remember exactly, it might have been, I think it was Diane. Anyway, and compare that to a SPAS uh, DAD and see what the differences were in space and time to make sure we have consistency uh, with those outcomes. We've done that for hundreds of storms now where we have previous DADs and SPAS DADs to make sure that we have the consistency needed uh, for usability going forward. So going forward, the questions become, how can we continue to improve this process? How can we utilize all those SPAS analyzed storms that have already been implemented for PMP development, precip frequency development, model calibration, and so on, and continue to build on that? How can we integrate and utilize the other data sets that have already been talked about today and will be talked about going forward to make one overall data set that's usable for everybody, is producing outputs that are accurate and reliable enough to use in PMP design for critical and high hazard infrastructure and so on. Well, obviously there's there's many things that we've already talked about. You, you can't have too many quality observations, right? Especially for hourly and sub hourly. Um, you know, we, we talked a lot about daily, but obviously there's many basins around the country that respond uh, to their PMF and to the flood on a, on a sub daily perspective and even a sub hourly perspective. So we have to have good information at those levels. Obviously, NextRad Weather Radar and so on does a great job of helping out with the spatial information and timing uh, down to five minutes. But there's other issues, of course, with that. As I showed, when it's uncorrected, we have a lot of problems. There's beam blockage, there's radar coverage issues, and so on. Then we have you know, coverage from satellite remote sensing, which has its own issues in, in magnitude and timing and, and so on. So overcoming those challenges by having more observations on the ground cannot be overstated. Obviously, consistency in the way that that precipitation information is processed and analyzed and the consistency of the outputs that are needed is, is critical. Um, accuracy, you know, quantification of uncertainty, just, just thinking about how much uncertainty there is in what we think is a great rain gauge observation. You know, if it's a very windy condition, um, if it's affected by frozen precipitation or hail or other things, how much uncertainty there is just in that one observational data set and then how that gets uh, carried through through the entire data set. And of course, that's why you want to use all the different pieces of information to help uh, best quantify the magnitude of accumulation and not just rely on one aspect. But really trying to get better quantification of the uncertainty of rain gauge observations themselves. Uh, that's ongoing research that should continue so we can understand and quantify that going forward. Obviously, there's been a lot of work in the past to quantify two, two and identify extreme rainfall events, and that needs to continue so we can have consistency and utilize those old events. Uh, they're very important for setting the level of PMP throughout the, uh, the country. Um, and then, of course, that database needs to be accessible and updatable going forward so new storms and information can continue to be added and adjustments can be made. Transposition limits, as discussed earlier, are still a key, key unknown that really I don't know how we're going to have the answer to that. Very subjective, varies by storm type, season, topography, and other aspects. But having that database of information in a stored cat, storm catalog will certainly put us in the right place to be able to answer uh, those transposition uh, questions. So what's next? I mean, really, all the stuff that we're doing with this committee and the people that we're talking about, there's so much great work out there. Hopefully, it can be integrated and incorporated and kind of taking the best components of each piece to continue to improve the process. And, you know, um, Obviously, we've done a ton of work to develop storms and storm information uh, directly for PMP development. 
And uh, but certainly, you know, we don't pretend to know all the answers or have all the perfect information. So let's try and get all those pieces together uh, from the modeling side, from the reanalysis side, from the from the um, observational side, using radar data and satellite remote sensing and kind of take the best of all those pieces to to answer these questions and come up with a storm catalog that uh, uh, really answers the bell for all this and can continue to be updated through time. Um, so anyway, hopefully that kind of helps out. Obviously, 15 minutes isn't a lot of time to get into the background detail. So we'd be happy to answer some questions on the SPAS process and how it's been developed and used for PMP through time. So thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Bill. Um, and let's see, as questions queue up, let me uh, just start with one on the rainfall processing. Uh, the, the dynamic adjustment of um, the radar rainfall estimates, hourly time scale. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what the key issues are in um, effectively uh, carrying out uh, adjustments at, uh, at that short time scale? Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, the, the, the bias correction, the adjustment and the best fit to derive the best fit ZR equation is going to be based on the number of observations you have for any given radar scan or any given hour, right? So on any given hour over the entire SPAS domain, we're taking in all the observational uh, information we have, and we're saying how much rainfall is falling in each of those points. How does that relate to the um, reflectivity, ZR, ZR reflectivity over that same point? And then how can we, what kind of bias correction needs to be applied at that point and then applied spatially throughout the entire domain to get a best fit between all those points? Of course, the problem is a couple of things. One. We're assuming that observation at that given hour is has is accurate, right? We're assuming that rain gauge observation is ground truth. Two, um, we're assuming that the radar reflectivity over that rain gauge observation is reflective of what happened on the ground right there, right? Well, obviously, uh, depending on the the base of the cloud, the wind, and so on, uh, the the reflectivity grid above that observation may actually be you know, upstream or downstream of what the observation on the ground actually occurred, right? So you're, but but we know those things, you recognize them. And so you try to overcome them by the power of big data and having lots of observations and good statistical fits and statistical analyses throughout the entire domain every hour and, and make those corrections. Um, so that's that's kind of the process of how you're trying to go through that using as many observations as possible over a large domain under the entire, you know, singular storm event and making correction every hour that fits the observational data. Great. Um, one uh, additional question along those lines, and um, um, but kind of veering into application of the STORM catalog, um, what are the kind of key lessons you've learned about, um, uh, about how to objectively carry out um, STORM transposition? And then we have a question from Effie to follow up. Yeah, yeah. storm transpositioning is obviously one of the biggest things we deal with in all the PMV studies we deal with. And, you know, it's, it's an iterative process, right? Obviously, there's a feel as a meteorologist for understanding the storm type, the seasonality, the interactions of topography, uh, coastal convergence, other factors that may come into what, how did that storm develop? How did that storm, what did that storm look like from an overall synoptic characteristic? And how does that fit into the storm types of the region you're looking at? Then you want to look at the data analysis, the results and the information when you move those storms around. So, for example, let's say we're doing a study. Um, uh, let's just we'll just use simply the state of Pennsylvania, right? So we and and Jim, this is you know this very well. The uniqueness of the incredible rainfall events that happen in the Appalachians, such as Smithport, uh, such as June of 1995, such as Red Bank 1996, right? There's there's a very unique combination of topography, moisture availability, and atmospheric dynamics that happen in the north central and central Appalachians that cause these extreme localized rainfalls, right? Well, you have to ask yourself, where else could that type of event happen in the region with that same kind of combination? That's a subjective um, question, but you can look at what's happened around the region to figure that out. Obviously, you look at the topography differences, access to moisture, seasonality, synoptic conditions, and so on, to help make those decisions. Then as you're doing a PMP study, you're putting those pieces together to see how they fit. And if you're seeing unnatural meteorological um, 
uh, you know, gradients across a region, that's you shouldn't ignore that. That's probably telling you that you've moved a storm too far or not far enough, and or you just have not observed a storm in your database yet to fill in that gap. And you have to make those kind of decisions. So the storm catalog process, the whole point of that is to have enough information to understand and hopefully have identified enough storms to fill in those gaps of subjectivity and unknown. And so you don't have to move storms around further than necessary. You have enough data in a given region that you are feeling confident is usable for that region from which to drive your PMP estimates. And then of course, peel back that layer of conservatism uh, that you may have applied by moving storms further than they should have gone. Thanks, um, Effie. Uh, hi, Bill. Thanks a lot for the very interesting pre presentation. You emphasized to use the best of all data sets, which I completely agree. You emphasized also, uh, and you saw some impressive, uh, impressive example of the uncertainties in the ZR relationship uh, or the point gauge observations. But I missed a little what approaches you use to propagate all these uncertainties into the uncertainty quantification of the PMP. You see what I mean? Yes, we, we have all the observations, we have their uncertainties, we have the transposition, et cetera, but at the end of the day, how do I put all this together? It's not trivial. Yeah, <laughs> that's a great, great question. And obviously today I wasn't able to show that, but you know, based on the Mikovic paper from 2015, we have uh, developed a whole process to quantify the, the range of uncertainty of each of the components that go into PMP development. So we have a range of uncertainty of uh, rain gauge observation, spas analysis, dew point climatology, storm transpositioning, storm efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. We analyze each of those individual components of PMP development uh, to come up with a range of uh, potential outcomes. Then you put them all together as one overall uncertainty process. And then what you do, what we do, Okay, here's our deterministic best estimate of PMP. Let's say the depth is 20 inches in 24 hours at a given basin. Well, if you put all those ranges of uncertainty together into one histogram, it could have been somewhere between 15 inches and 35 inches, right? So where does your best estimate fall with that overall range of uncertainty? Um, so we, we do that in all of our studies now because it's very informative to understand each of these components of PMP development has its own range of uncertainty. Yeah. This spot process is just one of them. And how do we all can, those fit together? Yeah. We can discuss another time because there's- Exactly no, right. That was going to say, hopefully- yeah, well, be, 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 Because propagating only the uncertainty of the observations is not enough. It's, it's a right. probabilistic uh, you know, concept. I mean, in the, start, in the transposition, for example, you could have <laughs> attached probability of transposing it. But we'll discuss another time. I think it's, uh, thank you. That's right. That's right. And I'll just add to that, we do a probability. Can we say, um, Bill, we've got a question from Chris yeah. Pachor. Let's yeah, move sorry. on. Sorry about that. Stuart, Chris. Um, yeah, I guess, I mean, just briefly to follow up on that, is there... Um, I need to look at the Minkovitz paper. Is there, do you guys have anything written up that describes your um, characterization of uncertainty that we could take a look at? We do. I will uh, share that with you. We have a couple of, of real world examples and actual PMP development where we applied that and actually made a change to PMP estimation based on the outcomes of that. Okay, thanks. And then, yeah, with regard to the question about um, combining data sets, I'm, I should say in uh, context here, I'm get, just getting up to speed on how all this is done as a statistician, just seeing this for the first time. Um, I agree that it makes sense to try and use the best available data, but then it also seems like that raises the danger of sort of very bespoke analyses in, for each individual case. So I guess I'm just, uh, I'm not quite sure what my question is, except to say, is the idea that you're developing your own storm catalog where you're doing sort of very careful analysis of each individual event that you look at, and then for each individual event, you're trying to bring in and make use of the best data available for that event. Is that the sort of bespoke nature of what you're uh, of what, what you're doing here? Yeah, you've characterized that well. Yeah, but we still have the issue of trying to understand what do we consider ground truth, right? Right now, we consider rain gauge options to be the most accurate uh, available data set we have, but even those have their own uncertainty and issues. Uh, yeah. But we have to have something that we're uh, ground truthing to when we're making these adjustments and trying to bring in the best pieces from other data sets to come up with a final picture, right? Okay, thanks, that helps. Great, thanks, Bill. And with that, we'll uh, move on to our next presentation from uh, Laura Slavinsky from, uh, from NOAA, Laura. 
Great. Um, all right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so I come from the NOAA Physical Sciences Lab. Uh, I'm not a PMP expert, um, but I was one of the co-leads on the 20th century reanalysis. And so today I'm going to try to give a perspective uh, on reanalyses and I'll try to answer as many of the questions as I can. So uh, the two questions that I was posed with um, are reanalysis fields, and in particular, the 20th century reanalyses suitable for historical reconstructions of storm environments for PMP magnitude storms? Um, and my answer, which feels like a cop out, but is true, is that they can be, but this is a research question. Um, it's not you know, it's not a yes or no, right? And I'll go into a little bit um, my take on it, but um, it's it really is a research question. Uh, and then the second question is how the suitability of reanalysis data changes over time. Uh, and the short answer here is that the accuracy of reanalysis data really depends on the observing network at the time that you're interested in. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about trend studies and when and how reanalyses can be used for that. Um, basically, they, they can sometimes uh, if you're careful. So just to provide some fundamentals on reanalysis for those who are not experts, um, reanalyses provide a consistent gridded record of weather, weather and climate by assimilating historical observations into a modern weather forecast model. Um, to achieve consistency, and here I'm talking about consistency in time of the reanalysis data set, we fix a forecast model, our weather prediction model, uh, and we fixed a fix a data assimilation algorithm. Uh, and to some degree, you can fix the observing network uh, to further make your, your reanalysis consistent. So um, to that end, I guess I'll, I'll mention two uh, terms that I'll use a couple times throughout this talk, um, which is full input and sparse input reanalysis. So full input reanalyses include ERA interim, ERA 5, MERA, MERA 2. Uh, and these assimilate most observations that are available. In particular, uh, they assimilate in situ as well as satellite, upper air, and aircraft. Um, they generally only cover the latter half of the 20th century uh, to avoid spurious trends and signals that can arise from significant changes in the observing system. So if you tried to do a 100-year reanalysis um, or 150-year reanalysis uh, and then added all the observations as, you, as they came on, you'd see some pretty um, intense trends that are not correct. Um, but these can still be impacted by just a single instrument coming online. And I'll, I'll show an example of, um, of that happening later. On the other side of the spectrum, we have sparse input reanalyses. This includes the 20th century reanalysis, um, version 2C and version 3, which is what I co-led, uh, as well as the European Center has uh, SARA 20C. Uh, these assimilate only surface observations. So the 20th century reanalysis only assimilates surface pressure. Uh, the European reanalyses also assimilate marine winds. Um, and because we're not trying to assimilate satellites or upper air, we can extend uh, 100 years or even further into the past uh, with not as much impact on the estimates from changes in our observing network. Uh, so a little bit more detail on the 20th century reanalysis. Uh, again, we only assimilate surface pressure observations, um, but we use a modern weather model to kind of spread out the information from those observations in a physically meaningful way. Um, version three of the reanalysis uh, is on a three quarters of a degree grid, 75 kilometers, and is available every three hours from 1806 to 2015. Um, and there are efforts underway to extend that further. Um, and as we develop future versions of the reanalysis, this is something that we're going to consider as uh, being able to keep it more close, uh, more closely up to date. Um, I also want to mention, I skipped over this, but we prescribe sea surface temperatures, sea ice concentration, and radiative forcings. And that's because we're in atmospheric reanalyses. Uh, reanalysis. If we were in ocean atmosphere reanalysis, then the sea surface temperature would be uh, a little bit different. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of the data assimilation method, of course, um, except to mention that the algorithm we use it has 80 ensemble members to quantify uncertainty. Uh, and I think this is really important, and I'm going to touch on this point a couple times, um, that having that large ensemble to quantify the uncertainty can be really useful. Um, and as an example, I'll show on the left here, 
Uh, these are the synoptic conditions from the Great Blizzard of 1888 uh, in March. And so you can kind of see the outline of the US here. In the top left, this is the ensemble mean sea level pressure from our reanalysis in the contours. You can see the storm here. The teal dots are all the surface pressure observations that we assimilated. And then in the shading, I'm showing our measure of confidence. And so in the yellow and white colors, we're more confident. And so you can tell that we're more confident where we have more observations and we're less confident, um, like in the Pacific Ocean, where we don't have as many observations. Um, the top right panel is the 500 millibar geopotential height and its confidence. And then I also have the ensemble mean two meter air temperature in the bottom left uh, and the precipitation in the bottom right, showing that we are getting the, the cold uh, and the wet. <laughs> Uh, and finally, our data is publicly available as long as, as well as um, this figure is also at that website. So getting to the questions that I was asked to answer, um, the suitability of reanalysis for reconstructing storm environments. Um, the first thing I'll say is that I would say that full input uh, reanalyses like ERA-5 might be more accurate um, in terms of reconstructing individual storms because they would assimilate uh, all are most available observations. I um, also mentioned that ERA-5 is now available back to 1940, as of just like a couple weeks ago, I think. Um, and it's available hourly and at a quarter degree resolution in the atmosphere. If you want to go earlier than 1940, uh, or if you want like a longer sample size in time, um, you would need to use a sparse input reanalysis like 20CR. Um, and I will just, Mention this is, you may want to use downscaling techniques to increase the resolution, um, as in Mahoney et al. 2022, which I think we're going to hear a little bit more about in the next talk. Um, and again, ensemble-based methods, like what 20CR uses, are key for measuring uncertainty and confidence in its estimates. Um, and I'll also mention that ideally, individual ensemble members should be used for nonlinear calculations. As we know, the mean of a nonlinear function is not the same the nonlinear function of a mean. Um, and I think Mahoney et al. also noted that you get uh, less extreme extremes uh, if you're using the ensemble mean than if you're using individual members. So one thing I do need to mention is model biases. So because reanalyses are combining models with observations, um, they're not free from uh, some of the biases in the models. And so what I'm showing here is the figure from uh, the 2021 paper on 20CR B3 showing some of the biases in precipitation. So on the left, I'm showing uh, 20CR V3 biases relative to uh, GPCP, which is a satellite station blend, uh, and then crew TS on the bottom, which is a station-based uh, reconstruction. Um, so you can see that there are biases in both. The signs don't always match. So in other words, the 20CR estimate lies in between the two instrumental um, the satellite and station reconstructions. Uh, and then on the right, I'm showing the same biases for ERA-5. Um, and we see somewhat similar magnitudes actually, um, and also different signs. And also ERA-5's uh, bias, the sign of the bias is not always the same between um, relative to the two different stations. So um, basically biases are something that we can't really completely get away from and something that really needs to be kept in mind. Despite that, I do wanna point out that uh, basically 20CR captures variability in precipitation um, surprisingly well in certain cases. Uh, so on the top here, I'm showing a time series of precipitation for January over the Western US, um, all the way from 1836 out to 2015. Uh, and the red curve is 20 CR V3. Uh, and what I want to point out is that the correlations with the um, station and satellite reconstructions in the 20th and 21st centuries, these correlations are all above 0.9. Um, so we're getting that variability uh, in January quite well, um, less so in July. And that was uh, something that we were expecting is that the summer uh, estimates would not be as good. And the other thing I want to point out in this figure is our uncertainty estimate. This is based on our ensemble spread um, and it increases further back in time as you have fewer observations as you expect. So that's the shading here that's quite wide in the 19th century 
um, much more narrow in the uh, 20th and 21st centuries. Um, and I said that I would mention the uh, suitability of reanalysis for trend analysis. Um, and I want to sort of give this, I'll say cautionary tale, I guess, um, of a spurious trend that was seen um, in MERA. So this is precipitation from MERA in the um, red curve on the bottom left. Uh, and where I have this orange vertical line here, uh, you see that not only does the magnitude change of precipitation, but also the variability um, qualities change pretty drastically. Um, and what actually happened is that in 1998, the ATOPS instruments all started being assimilated. Um, and potentially uh, what happened is that Mara was using a, had a model with a dry bias that may have been corrected once those instruments came online. So you see this pretty, um, it's a pretty bad signal in Mara if you're trying to analyze precipitation from that data set. Um, 20 CRV3 is in blue. It doesn't have that trend because it never assimilates any radiances. Um, and what I do want to mention, even though this is a cautionary tale here, uh, this is something that producers of reanalyses are always looking out for and always trying to fix. So ERA5 and MERA2 don't have this issue um, because they became aware of it and bias corrected the model and the observations. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't other issues. So. Coming back to my answer of it being a research question, there are a lot of things um, to keep an eye on as you're, as you're trying to use these data sets. So to return to those questions, um, are reanalysis fields uh, suitable for historical reconstructions? Again, they can be, but it's a research question. Uh, in general, 20CR captures precipitation variability well, um, but there are biases. Um, but 20 CR fields have been used for this purpose with downscaling me uh, methods with results that depend on the storm situation. So again, is a research question. In some storms, it can work pretty well. Uh, in other storms, it maybe doesn't work well. Um, and again, the ensemble method to quantify your uncertainty can be really useful there. Does the suitability of reanalysis data change over time and how? Um, again, the accuracy depends on the observing network at the time. So in more, more recent years, and if you have more observations, your reanalysis should be more accurate. Um, if you're trying to go back to the 19th century, um, it's going to be less accurate. But if you're in a place where there are observations, um, you can look at even the spatial quality of your uncertainty um, using ensemble-based methods. Um, and finally, I talked about trend studies and I gave that cautionary tale. Um, significant observing network changes can lead to spurious trends and discontinuities. The benefit of 20CR is that it only ever assimilates one type of observation. Um, so it's not as subject to these types of discontinuities. Um, and I kind of raced through that, so. Well, we'll see if, um, if we can get Laura back online. Um, but her presentation does cue up the next presentation uh, from, uh, from Gary Lackman. So um, why don't we uh, move into the next presentation and then we'll, uh, we'll save all the questions uh, for Gary and for Laura until the end. Gary. Okay, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. Um... Yeah, well, uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity. I'm really happy to be able to speak to the committee. Um, and I'll be talking more about downscaling and reanalyses, as Jim mentioned. Uh, just a little bit about me, since I don't know all of you. I'm a dyed-in-the-wool atmospheric scientist, uh, not a hydrologist. And so um, I am not, I'm just learning about PMP. <laughs> But I study synoptic and uh, mesoscale atmospheric dynamics and weather modeling and prediction. And for many years, I've uh, studied the role of moist dynamics in weather systems. And so it was sort of a natural extension to take that work into the climate change and extreme weather realm. And so I've looked at a lot of these sort of synoptic scale weather systems in this context. Um, and I also just wanted to point out some of the current and former students whose work I'll be sharing here. Uh, Alice Michaelis is now at Northern Illinois. 
uh, Katie Hollinger is a current PhD student, and Chun Yang Jung is at uh, Argonne National Lab. Um, Gary, do you Gary, kind of sharing your screen? Oh, huh, I must have. Thanks for pointing that out. Let's try. Are you seeing it now? Yes. Okay, great. Well, let me let me hide the video controls. Make it so I can see it here. Okay, so um, yeah, sorry about that. So I guess maybe what got me into this, um, again, the blizzard of 1888, um, Alice and Michaelis was an undergraduate student who wanted to do a project on snowstorms and the 20th century reanalysis had just come out. And so we wondered, could we use this to initialize uh, the weather research and forecasting model, sort of look at the dynamics and look at things that no one had ever seen like radar associated with this storm, simulated radar. and uh, you know, somewhat to our surprise, this was using version two of the 20th century reanalysis. Uh, we were able to capture the storm and it even had an area of accumulation that exceeded 40 inches. It wasn't in exactly the right place, but considering that we initialized with the ensemble mean, we were pretty pleased with this. And we published a paper in GRL, um, you know, presenting these results. It was sort of a proof of concept type uh, study. Um, but now on to my question. So uh, another former NC State student, Kelly Mahoney, I'm really uh, impressed by all that she's doing in this area. Um, you know, she published this blast from the past paper and that led to the question, are downscaling simulations of extreme rainfall events using these reanalyses uh, useful for the reconstruction of PMP type storms? And I think, Yes, it is a research question, as, as Laura indicated, but I also think that there's an opportunity to more directly account for climate change, and I'll elaborate on that in a minute. Um, and then my second question was, you know, what are the settings where these downscaling reconstructions will have the most potential utility uh, for enhancing the storm catalogs? And I think there's opportunities in many settings. Uh, I asked for clarification on if we meant meteorological settings versus geographical or temporal settings, I think for meteorological settings, uh, as the Mahoney et al. paper demonstrated, if you have uh, kind of a well-organized large-scale forcing for a cool season event, you'll have much better model outcomes than for localized convective summertime events. But a lot of times those are the PMP type storms in the warm season when there's more vapor. Um, also the geographical settings, I think where you have complex terrain and you, and you benefit more from model resolution than downscaling could help. And also in locations where you don't have as good of a period of record, I think these reanalyses could add more uh, benefit. But I'll expound on these things uh, as we go. Um, a little bit about downscaling since it hasn't been talked about too much. Um, you know, we, we all know that GCMs just don't have the resolution. I, I would say that GCMs are not tropical cyclone allowing. And in the Southeast and Eastern US, so many of the PMP type events are tropical cyclone related. So, you know, the high res MIP simulations are just barely getting there, but you're still not getting full strength storms. So, to address this, um, my former student uh, and now Northern Illinois professor, uh, Allison Michaelis, did some really nice uh, computationally demanding time slice simulations with the model for prediction across scales with a 15 kilometer Northern hemisphere uh, mesh. And that could simulate full strength tropical storms. Um, there's also interesting work that's been done at NCAR with this long-term large domain pseudo-global warming or PGW experiment. There's been many, many papers published using this data set. Uh, it was a four kilometer grid mesh, uh, a 13 year present day with a 13 year future counterpart. Uh, and you could use that to look at changes in storm character and whatnot. Um, this PGW method we've used a lot for individual case study you know, so this is sort of transposition in time, if you will. Uh, and that goes back to the mid 90s with Christoph Scher at ETH and several groups in Japan have done this. We've used this method, but that way you can 
sort of get a fully consistent dynamical replication of an event and you can study the physical processes and how it changes and why. Uh, and then, of course, there's many statistical downscaling methods, um, and that's uh, I won't get into that today. Um, but you know, just a little bit more about this pseudo global warming, um, which is consistent with the storyline framing of Shepard 2016 or the Tales of Future Weather by Hazelager et al. Um, you you take your best reanalyses or analyses and you simulate a uh, extreme event. For example, here's Hurricane Sandy. You run an ensemble, compare it to observations, um, and then you can use uh, historical or future projections, calculate a, a delta, uh, and apply that to the initial and boundary condition data, and then re-simulate the event in a different thermodynamic environment. So you can go either way. You can simulate a past event or a future event. Uh, you could use this to take a historical event and bring it into the present day, but you're accounting for the thermodynamic changes. Uh, you're not fully accounting for the larger scale circulation changes, but you're saying if this storm were to happen in this different thermodynamic environment, how would its uh, structure and characteristics and impacts change? So uh, for Hurricane Sandy, we did this. The present day ensemble worked out pretty well compared to observations. Uh, we did a historical Sandy because I was getting lots of calls from reporters saying how much of this was climate change. So we we dialed it back, subtracted out the uh, using the GC the historical GCM runs. We calculated a delta and, and simulated a pre-industrial Sandy. Uh, we also went forward and did a future Sandy uh, using the CMIP three GCMs and a high end emission scenario. Um, and again, we apply a temperature delta, hold relative humidity constant, and then that way your moisture delta has synoptic scale structure because you get more vapor increase where you're warmer and less where you're colder. Um, and so we were able to simulate the storm in different environments. Um, I published a bulletin paper. Uh, the group at Connecticut um, was looking at how this, what the implications this would have for uh, power grid impacts, for example, but you can analyze since you have a, a full ensemble of physically consistent model simulations, you can look at the changes and their causes and um, it's sort of a, a way of looking at the same event and uh, transposition in time, if you will, using the uh, PMP nomenclature. Uh, but again, there's limitations because you're not capturing the changes due to larger scale uh, changes, for example, shifts in the jet or the storm tracks. Um, we've done this for a variety of different types of events, some idealized, some actual case studies. And the nice thing is that you can look at uh, precipitation rates at high resolution, high temporal or spatial resolution. and um, you can look at compound hazards, the combination of wind and precipitation. Uh, we're currently doing some sequential storm analysis in the Appalachians with Francis and, and Ivan from 2004. And uh, you know the results are consistent and realistic to the extent that the model governing equations and model physics parameterizations are realistic. So that comparison to observations for the present day case is, is critical. Um, but there are limitations. And one question that comes up is, you know, if you're picking individual case studies and looking for the future climate version of them, what if there's different future patterns that will produce events that are even more extreme than the historical cases? And I think this is relevant for PMP as well. And so you can use other methods to get at that question, for example, uh, high resolution time slice simulations uh, that sort of try to sample a range of natural variability. Um, you can avoid the pseudo global warming boundary condition issues. You can account more for large scale circulation changes. And you can look at questions such as uh, frequency and representativeness. Um, and so you can basically simulate what the future climate would look like at higher resolution without the expense of a full-blown GCM uh, because you're just looking at a small uh, period of time. 
So uh, Allison Michaelis uh, did this for her PhD dissertation um, using the impasse model with a 15 kilometer grid in the Northern hemisphere, not quite convection allowing, but certainly tropical cyclone allowing. And um, we've analyzed, we haven't fully analyzed the precipitation data out of there, but you can sort of do a model climate uh, PMP by looking at the maximum six hourly precipitation rate for the present day simulations, the future simulations, and then the difference fields. Uh, so if we had a bigger model run with a longer uh, integration period and say an ensemble, you could really do um, a, a complete storm catalog using a method like this. Um, there's also a current project we have here with the North Carolina Department of Transportation and, and Ken Kunkel is also involved with that. And it's led by uh, Jared Bowden um, and, uh, and Kathy Dello, who's the state climatologist. And the, you know, there's, I see a lot of parallels with the NOAA PMP effort. And that's why I wanted to bring this up. They're looking at sort of federal highways requirements for downscaling, and they're asking us for design storms or stress test storms. And they're interested in combining this with uh, kind of the statistical downscaling that they're using. And they're taking the gridded precipitation data from the model simulations and running it through uh, HECRAS and you know, their hydrologic models to look at inundation. And they're trying to find ways to improve uh, the resilience of transportation infrastructure. So I, I see potential coordination uh, with that effort. Um, as part of that, Katie Hollinger did these PGW simulations for Hurricane Matthew in 2016. Here's the stage four. Here's the present day simulated uh, ensemble mean. We usually use the probability matched mean, but this is the ensemble mean, and that's using a four kilometer uh, weather research and forecasting ensemble. And then we can look at things like, you know, the histogram of rain rates for the present and future version of the storm and the difference histograms. Uh, we also can do heat maps of rain rates exceeding certain thresholds. These are the kind of things that the DOT was interested in seeing and, and how they changed. Um, also, Katie Hollinger is working with uh, uh, hydrodynamics. Two minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Antonio Sebastian, who's a, a new professor at UNC Chapel Hill, and she has uh, expertise in sort of how land use affects uh, runoff and flooding and inundation. Uh, she was on the attribution study of Hurricane Harvey and looking at how urban land use in Houston and the bayou configuration affected flooding there. But it's, I've been learning a lot because that's not my, my typical area, but Katie has been working with uh, Tony and learning about uh, what happens when the rain hits the ground, as Katie likes to say. So this will be a component of her dissertation to take the output from these uh, simulations and uh, look at the hydrology at very high resolution. Um, recently, uh, Ken had a PhD student, Geneva Gray, who did her defense just a week or so ago. And she said, if you're doing these pseudo global warming uh, downscaling studies, you need to apply the statistical context. And so Katie uh, made this diagram where it compares the, uh, the Atlas 14 return period with the 90, 90th percentile range to our uh, our model simulation. So you can see the present day Matthew was maybe a 500 year event uh, by uh, Atlas uh, 14 standards. But then the future Matthew is just, you know, off beyond uh, the chart there. Both of these were below the PMP hourly uh, 10 square mile uh, simulations. But I think this kind of context and consistency between these data sets is helpful. So to you know, try to wind things up, um, I think Mahoney et al. made a compelling case for the use of historical simulations, but I think you could transposition those cases in time to say, well, if those historical storms happened in the present climate, how would their precipitation characteristics change? Um, you know, for me, I'm learning about PMP when I look at some of these, you know, the moisture adjustment and the uh, moisture maximization. I think that's that's really pretty crude. The reference is from 1947. I, I tracked it down, and uh, you know that's pre-gridded data. You know, and so we, I think we could do a lot better now, with all due respect to the the smart people who who came up with those methods. 
But I think the dynamical models, just due to their physical consistency, if they're used carefully, that can add a lot of value and also help maybe better understand the relation between variables uh, as the type that's used in these uh, HMRs, uh, including you know, integrated vapor transport, uh, dew point, et cetera. Um, so just to return to the prompt questions, um, are these uh, useful? I think yes, uh, but they might be even more useful with a uh, direct account of climate change. Um, and also, I think the, these large domain, long duration pseudo global warming or time slice simulations, if you, you know, had a really uh, a big computer and, and a lot of resources, you could really make a more complete PMP type catalog that's valid not only today, but would be valid into the future. And uh, in terms of the settings, I think I mentioned this before, um, so I won't uh, repeat all of this, but I think that you know, some events are much harder to model than others, as Mahoney et al. demonstrated. And so I think, uh, you know, certainly summertime, uh, you know, organized convection or large scale forcing is, is better, uh, lends itself to better model uh, results. And also there's some places where the existing catalog is probably weaker. Uh, and we know that high resolution models benefit us in areas of complex uh, terrain. So I'll quickly uh, say thanks for the opportunity. Again, I'll quickly pop up these references of some of the papers that I mentioned, and then I'll leave it uh, here and be happy to take questions as time permits. Here, I'll start off with a, uh, I think Ruby's jumped in, so we'll- uh... Uh, No, go, go ahead, yeah, you can, yeah, please. Uh -huh. you, you want, you'd like to ask first, yeah. Uh -huh. um, I'll go second, Ruby. Okay, all right. Hey, Gary, thank you very much for the for the presentation. Very interesting. So I have a question. <clears throat> so I, I know that people have done downscaling uh, to look at PMP for the present day by maximizing the moisture. And then you talk about these PGW type of experiments where we account for the non-stationarity of the climate and adding the temperature change and then, and then the moisture change. But I'm not aware of um, studies that actually come combine the two because what we need to know is under non-stationary climate in the future, we still need to maximize what might happen, right? Because, because the moisture change may not necessarily be simply scale with the temperature. So we need to maximize. So I'm, I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts about that or, or are you aware of studies that combine looking at non-stationarity with maximization of moisture? Yeah, that's a great question, Ruby. And I, I don't know of studies that have really accounted for the maximization part. Um, in a way, you know, I, I when I review the PMP, I, I'm like I said, I'm learning about PMP now, and the moisture maximization part makes me a little queasy. Uh, but it does have the word probable, I guess, and the P and the first P in PMP is probable. So, uh, but it. The technique that they use for that, uh, using a moist adiabat through the dew point, um, I, I think we probably could do better than that. The, the way to really account for this possibly is if you had a, a big enough computer simulation, um, maybe we wouldn't need to maximize moisture if we had enough ensemble members and enough resolution, mm -hmm. a long enough period of integration, then you could, you know, maybe that would be a potential replacement for this maximization uh, but it would take a really large ensemble exactly to do yes. that. Uh -huh. <laughs> but down the road that may be possible all right thank you very much yeah thanks uh, gary my question was similar it was um looking in the current environment not even thinking about um uh, future climates um moisture maximization was uh, and is one of the uh, key uh, ingredients of uh, current PMP methods. Um, and, and there are also, uh, there's a long line of research suggesting that uh, extreme precipitation doesn't work that way. It doesn't scale with uh, precipitable water. Uh, the question uh, the question I was wondering is if you had thoughts about how, um, how would you sort of go about thinking about maximization uh, of precipitation, so so take Harvey. Um, you know what would be um, the 
um, the computing procedures that you would use to try and assess uh, what would what would it take to make Harvey worse? Are there uh, are there sort of realistic um, uh, bounds on Harvey? Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. And the, the first thought that comes to mind is this sort of ensemble sensitivity analysis methods that people like Ryan Torn at Albany and uh, and Jim Doyle and Carolyn Carolyn Reynolds at NRL. Uh, where you can use the ensemble to figure out how a change in a certain part of the domain would affect uh, some variable, some metric. Uh, for example, it could be rainfall in a given watershed. So you could use ensemble sensitivity to get at that. Um, you know, basically to say, okay, let's let's make this storm as bad as it can be, and you can use the that that method. Uh, which involves using the adjoint of the model to figure out where the sort of upstream sensitivities are. So there may be a way to maximize storm impact that isn't just moisture. It's um, also what could you do to maximize the impact uh, from a dynamical standpoint? There may be other variables in addition or besides moisture uh, that would lead to a more intense storm. So there may be potential. That's not exactly my area of expertise, but I know people who work in that area um, like I mentioned, Ryan and Jim and Carolyn, who who would barely uh, have ideas, but I'm sure that's doable. And there's other ways we could, uh, you know, I, I think that would be the most systematic way to address that. But I, I do think that it's possible to do that in a way that would improve upon the kind of the original uh, moisture maximization methods. Great. Chi Chi, uh, you have a question? Hi, uh, yes, uh, I actually have a question for both, uh, but I think they are somewhat related. Uh, so for Laura, um, I, I think uh, uh, I'm a hydrologist and for us, usually there is a big shock whenever, uh, when we comes to reanalysis by comparing the rainfall uh, directly to the gauge, then we realize we should not do that. Uh, but I think um, the, the, if we are moving forward, we're going to use the reanalysis as a part of the tool to support the PMP. That's the some, uh, question we need to uh, think about uh, either uh, how can we reuse it? I understand that not reanalysis basically don't assimilate rainfall gauge station in there. So you, you probably will still see a big bias in there, but I also hear that they are, uh, they are product like Mira also start to assimilate part of the precipitation. Uh, so anyway, I just it's more like a question and comment that uh, if we're going to use the rainfall depth output from reanalysis, what would the best practice? And, and similar thing for Gary is that uh, uh, we also did some downscaling work ourselves and uh, uh, the lesson we learned so far is uh, we, we cannot really just take the raw output to Plug, plug into a hydrological model and, and do a simulation because those are biases still being very um, big to a hydrological model. So what will be your recommendation uh, if one are going to use the output uh, to do some further H&H and, H and H simulation? Thank you. So Laura, then Gary on that one. Okay. Do we have Laura back? Sure. Yeah. I think so. Hopefully, can you hear <laughs> you're, you're pretty garbled. Can you turn uh, off the camera? So the first thing I was going to mention. Uh, is that better? Am I less garbled? I think so. Can you hear me okay? Go for it. <laughs> uh, well, I'll mention that ERA 5 actually assimilates um, rain gauge radar composites over the US, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, so there are reanalyses that are using um, that data. Uh, as far as the biases, I mean, I think from my point of view, it's always just been something to be aware of. Um, and I don't know that I would be the person to make a recommendation for how to um, deal with it issues between in the inconsistencies between the uh, observations and the reanalyses other than potentially um, if there's some sort of systematic bias that you could find and do some sort of post-processing to get from the reanalysis field to uh, your actual estimate that would be the only that would be my first thought 
yeah, I guess for the second part, uh, you know, I think what Mahoney et al. showed is that it, if you take the reanalysis, which is relatively low resolution, the 20th century reanalysis, and and simulate it uh, the event with an ensemble of high resolution, uh, you know, model runs using, for example, WARF. Um, you know, then you can add value, you're adding physical consistency, and you can check it against the available observations to see if it's, um, you know, in the ballpark. But I think for everything we do with models, we always run an ensemble, usually a physics ensemble, maybe also a physics and initial condition ensemble, so that you're really accounting for the uncertainty in the model atmosphere. Um, but I think using the raw, uh, the raw reanalysis output versus using post-processed run run through a mesoscale weather model output that would be an interesting comparison to make. But the model will give you, you know, the account of terrain influences, coastlines. It'll give you kind of that um, the higher resolution focus on the event. And if it's a small scale event, you know, a convective storm, for example, uh, I think you'd you'd have to have that. Um, but running the ensemble is is really important, I think, to account for the the variability. Thank you. Let's see. So we we're open to questions for both Gary and Laura at this point. Um, let's see, Gary. One more question on on the coastlines um, bit. Um, in the state of Texas, uh, they recently um, had an update to their precipitation frequency atlas. And there's this really sharp gradient or sharp maximum in the Houston uh, metropolitan area in Southeast Texas. Uh, and then there's sort of more subtle features along the Balcones escarpment. Um, is it asking too much of model simulations to capture uh, that level of detail for the, the really high end storms? I think you know models where they can really add value is with you know those kind of coastal and terrain influences. If if the if you give it high resolution terrain, it will give you a consistent solution. I think you know kind of the the quantitative precipitation forecasting study papers have shown that you you benefit from resolution when you have sort of a topographic uh, element. Doesn't mean it's necessarily right, but in principle, the model should be able to represent uh, topographic and coastal features um, to the extent that kind of the geographic data in the model is, is realistic. And so I, I, I think it's uh, I think it's within reach. Yeah. Let's see. We've got John E. and um, and Effie. Laura and Gary, thanks for the wonderful presentations. This question's I guess more for Gary. Uh, following on with the high resolution. Um, what are your thoughts on exploiting the models to really dive into the physics so we can answer some modern day synoptic and mesoscale questions on, look, the P, you, you showed the equation from PMP, we're sort of after now when we include wind, right, in various terrain effects, what they can tell us about physical maxima and the, the way to look for us respectively, maybe in the future simulations with PGW or in this, even the ones you've analyzed, even a snowstorm. What are your thoughts on using those to look at some of those physical considerations? Yeah, well, th that's sort of what got me into this in the first place is we wanted to understand why the storms were changing. And we were really looking at the kind of the moist dynamics, the, the latent heat release, how that was affecting the storm dynamics. So you know, with a model, you can output, you know, the physics tendencies and you can really get into the, the processes. So that's definitely doable. In terms of how it relates to PMP and sort of how, could you make the perfect storm using the model, um, you know, that and, and understand sort of what you're, you know, how you would change the storm to make it the perfect storm. That's a good question. I've never tried doing that. Again, I think maybe that ensemble sensitivity would be a more of a systematic way to do that, but you, you can, uh, you know, I think that that is also within reach. Um, if that's really what the goal is to say, okay, the model is programmed with the laws of physics, uh, you know, it doesn't mean models can't produce horrible errors. <laughs> they can, 
but you know what is the the most rain you could get out of a given event um i've never tried to do that but I, i'm sure that that it could be done and maybe doing it that way where you can analyze the physics of what's happening in the model and why those changes are making uh, heavier precipitation that might be um, a good approach but I, I may be overly optimistic like i said i haven't tried that myself thanks very much yeah thank you So uh, listening everything today and the, you know, the realization of the complexities in the, you know, thermodynamics and the physical properties yeah, and that basically um, non-linearities for whatever we come up as the perfect storm and the uncertainty, the non-linearities in converting it to, uh, to, to a flood are real. It just occurred to me, are we basically taking the path of the PMP and uncertainty quantification around that, or we want to promote the concept of ensemble PMPs. You see, they're different. It's not like the perfect storm and how certain am I around that, but a whole ensemble that, for example, projected in the future will have uh, some of the ensemble members could, you know, capture more than certain than thermodynamics and other physical parameters and some other, you see, they're different things. The same as, uh, you know, it was said, I cannot take a ensemble mean and filter it through nonlinear operations and get something. I have to filter every single ensemble member through that transformation. So the concept of ensemble PMPs just occurred to me and I wanted to pass it by. Yeah, certainly, Laura, feel free to, to chime in. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of probabilistic predictions and ensembles and quantifying uncertainty. And to me, it's ironic that PMP is a deterministic product, but the first P is probable. <laughs> so uh, I, I think, you know, we, we shouldn't, I don't know if there exists a actual real upper limit for given durations. Uh, so I, I'm in favor of a probabilistic or ensemble type approach, uh, just because I think that's more scientifically realistic. Yeah, no, I, I don't question the deterministic versus probabilistic, but just whether we present a storm with plus minus uncertainty or an ensemble of storms. But we can discuss this more. Um, okay, yeah, well, yeah, an ensemble of storms, yes. I, I think the, the more, uh, members that are brought in, the, the better. But uh, yeah, Laura, do you want to comment on that one? Um, if I'm understanding correctly, I think what you're saying, yeah. I guess my only, what I would add to, other than the benefit of 20CR having an ensemble uh, representation, is also that because it's such a long time series, then you get that large, larger sample. And I think maybe that's kind of what you were getting at if he is like having more possible maximum storm like pmp magnitude storms right um anyway that's that's yeah and not a storm i just yeah storms in all their space time characteristics mm -hmm. just an ensemble of storms of possible mm -hmm. storms we're getting to the end of our scheduled time and i, I would uh, just ask now if the, any committee members have uh, any additional questions for any of the speakers who are still around. I think we've, uh, uh, yes, Katie. Hi, Jim. Uh, is Bill here? Is Bill still on the line? I, I have a question, and I'd like to tap into some of his expertise, right? Bill, you should yeah. be here. I'm here. I'm here. Yes. Yeah. You, you showed a figure of all the PMP studies that you've done across the world. And something that really struck me is like in, in all of your years of experience, do you, do you know sort of which aspects of your methodological chain, right? You have this large chain that you sort of follow when you compute these PMP estimates, which, which step, which decision impacts your PMP estimates the most? Yes, I do, and it's it's the uh, <laughs> the transposition process is the has is the most impactful. 
Um, and I and just just to let you know, I just sent a, a couple of papers examples where we've applied the uncertainty quantification of each major step to the PMP process, and you can show the range there. So you as a committee will be getting that from uh, uh, the group here soon, so you can kind of read through those examples and see exactly uh, what that answer is for you, Katie. Because you, you'll you'll see in the you know in the rainfall process, you know spas might be plus or minus twenty percent. The dew point sea surface temperature climatology must be might be plus or minus ten percent. But the choice of where and how to move storms and the adjustments applied is the biggest factor in that process. And that's consistent across these studies that we've looked at so far. Okay, thank you. Though I will say the one difference in other parts of the world with studies like in South America and Southeast Asia, where we have limited observational rain gauge data and period of record, that becomes much more important. In the US, that's not as big of a deal because you have really excellent rain gauge observational data, next red, red radar coverage, and so on. So that so it varies depending where, on where you are in the world. Yeah. Thanks. Um, let's see, I, I hear other questions um percolating but i don't uh i don't see them so i think at this point we uh will thank all of our speakers for uh very very um useful contributions to the committee's work um and we encourage um all of the community to uh respond and weigh in on the issues that uh that we've been uh wrestling with uh, today on the, the forums that are on the, uh, the, uh, the study side. Uh, with that, I think um, we can declare victory and, uh, and march forward on uh, modernizing uh, probable maximum precipitation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you Great, thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thanks to all Bye. the speakers. Thank you. Bye, thanks.